Salutations, listeners, and welcome back to Glitch Bottle, the podcast where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. I'm your host, Alexander F., and today we are so excited to welcome back to the podcast author, practicing occultist, ceremonial magician, and martial artist, Frater Ashen Chassan. And a little known fact, Frater Ashen Chassan was actually the very first ceremonial magician and author to ever appear on the Glitch Bottle podcast. It was such an honor then, and it's an honor now. And I know that thousands upon thousands of listeners are very familiar with Frater Chassan and his works. But if you haven't already, listeners, after checking this out, please check out Frater Chassan's previous uh, appearances on the podcast, where he discusses his two books, Gateways Through Stone and Circle and Gateways Through Light and Shadow, which discusses just wonderful experiences and practical tips on working with the seven Solomonic planetary archangels. Other topics Frater Chassan has covered, including uh, banishing comfort, working with his amazing scryer Ben on several operations, his magical journey with his wife, Charity, and Frater also sharing just all kinds of practical tips and, and observations for magic. And in this podcast, I'm so excited because Frater Chassan is here to talk about his amazing work and explorations into another grimoire, the Theurgia Goetia, as well as answer your Glitch Bottle Patreon listener questions, which thanks to each and every uh, member of the Patreon uh, supporters on patreon.com, your questions are awesome. So we're going to get into that and social media fasting and just all kinds of, of other uh, great tips. And so especially in a more digital world, just really, really important. And with all that being said, Frater Ashen Chassan, thank you just so, so much for taking the time and stopping by on the Glitch Bottle podcast today. Definitely my pleasure to be back. Thanks for having me. Oh my gosh, the honor's mine, Frater Chassan. I, I could not believe that it had been uh, a couple of years since you'd, since you'd been on. And um, you and I were chatting about this earlier in the week, but as we are recording this right now, the spring equinox has just passed. And I think... You're the perfect person to ask this, uh, Frater Chassan, but as a ceremonial magician, as a magician, um, can you share, how do you celebrate and honor the spirits during the changing of the seasons with the solstices, with the equinox? Do you have any tips or or anything you'd like to share with listeners? Yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a pointed time and there's a lot of reflections on the, the cycle of the year and what uh, the winter means that that comes before and usually a time of, you know, things going to rest or a lot of deep introspection or work and kind of the internal uh, looking inwards. And and uh, it's definitely has been a time for that. And then as uh, spring comes about the the new awakenings and uh, and life and uh, there's so many different messages that I think that come across of what that means as we honor and we pay attention to the cycle of life and uh, just like a new sprout coming up through the ground that when life happens, it's it's always beautiful, but it's not it's not painless. It's not uh, through comfort. Uh, a lot of times uh, new life is, is done through a, a time of gestation, but then something breaking breaking loose and breaking out. And it usually has to struggle in order for that life to emerge for a new life to emerge. It's, it's um, from plant to animal. Uh, it's usually a time of um, moving, breaking beyond comfort zones, getting out of previously made metaphorical boxes and such. And, uh, you know, really trying to establish what this, our new life means for us. So I think uh, it's a good time to acknowledge that that uh, if we could become different people, if we could do something brand new and break out of what we were before, you know, how are we going to do that? And uh, when I look at myself that way, you know, if it seems like a gentle or an easy process, then I know that I'm fooling myself in, in some regards. So it's, it usually is kind of a, uh, you know, working the the struggle means, but a struggle towards, towards a goal to hopefully something better. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's a great time to, to really spend and moving from contemplation, uh, hopefully in a time of, of action and, uh, you know, moving towards that goal in a more active way. Uh, there's meditations that I do, but for me personally, there's, um, there's also the change of the, the Almadel and the Almadel is, is a, a system that, uh, in its, traditional form at least that i'm used to with within the uh, lamegaton uh each of the tablets represents a, a time of the seasons and uh, when i practice 
uh, with those for two years, uh, I would really mark those equinoxes and solstices by the switching of the tablets and, and different set of angels. And these angels have uh, like different personas. They have different um, messages that they taught um, each time that I work with them. And uh, now I'd be switching around back to the white tablet and this reemergence of this, this fresh kind of uh, energy and to kind of uh, give new perspective uh, of not just yourself, but perhaps others, the world around. And um, I think if we're able to mentally and emotionally look at things with fresh eyes, uh, that can be so beneficial and healing because uh, it's difficult, especially in today's age with technology and constantly bombardment of media and messages about how messed up the things are in the world, um, you know, socially and and with government, so on and so forth, you go on and on, but uh, just giving the perspective, and it's not about being naive, but allowing, uh, I think, your your eyes and your heart to be open to perceiving perceiving yourself, perceiving others, perceiving the world as, as something that has the potentiality for, for something new. And uh, I think that can be very powerful. That's such such a needed perspective, Frater Shasan, because how many times, I, I know for myself, just you get caught in these thought patterns, you get caught in habits, you get caught in doing things a certain day, even if it's a daily ritual. You know, Sometimes you can do it rote instead of actually putting in, as, as you always say, the thought word and deed in, into that. So that is so awesome, uh, Frater. And you, know, you mentioned a few moments ago about this theme that I know is always front and center for you, which is banishing comfort. It is about, it should be a challenge. You cannot just be lukewarm. You have to jump in and you have to do it with uh, one of the first words you mentioned is sincerity. And to that very point, you are constantly exploring new things. You're constantly exploring new grimoires, you know, research, and most importantly, direct practice. And you have turned your attention uh, from drawing spirits into crystals, the Almadel, as you continue to do, and, and the Lamegatons Goetia, uh, to the second book in the Lamegatons Goetia, the Theurgia Goetia, which has to do with aerial spirits and uh, directionality is very important. Can you share with us, uh, Frater Chassan, about what is the Theurgia Goetia, if there's a listener out there, this is the first time that they're hearing about it? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating system, and uh, it's it's so interesting because in, in some ways it's it's very complex with the the spirit lists and the the number of sigils far outweighs uh, even the first book of the Goetia. I mean, there's sigils for each of these uh, spirits, and then you know rulers and and uh, deacons and ones uh, below them, and they're all matched up with a uh, compass point and all the points in between. And uh, it's such a, a fascinating system because at first it, it looks almost like another uh, registry uh, pretty much of uh, spirits like the Goetia, but there's some differences where they really talk about the spirits that one can do, the others can do, and, and they have all these similarities. And the, uh, the explanations about the, the spirits are, are a little vague. And um, I experimented a little bit um, early on when I was doing – all the other things that I was, but I, I only uh, attempted, you know, one or two rituals. But um, I, yeah, lately I've really spent some time getting <clears throat> the table, uh, the crystal, and all of the materials together, and then I've been able to uh, practice and uh, converse with some of the spirits in this system. At first, which I thought um, primarily would be evoking spirits that were entirely elemental. Um, it talks about them being of earth, air, fire, and water. And that's what I was primarily fascinated with because I enjoy working with elemental spirits and working with the kings and such. And uh, they do have Ill elemental natures indeed, but it's according to my experiences so far, they're a lot more complex where some of them are uh, of equal portions of, of two elements or one of them has a uh, direct relation to the other one for them to, to function, I guess, at their full capacity. At first, the, the instructions or at least their explanations about how they assist people or how they work, how they exhibit their office uh, in the world was um, a lot more uh, in-depth and, and complex than I was expecting um, originally. Um, each of them has uh, a direction 
and then later later timing as as well but for each one that i've done they've talked about others and the relationship to the the other spirits not only the ones that um are beneath them and i guess that they're in charge of but the ones across from them and that at the angle and they serve different purposes they can they can help in different ways uh depending on how you contact them um in unison so um it's been very fascinating i still have a long way to go with uh discovering their their full potential but uh they you know talking and, and asking them about uh their origins and asking them directly about you know their names and and uh you know how they work in the world uh it's it's been some of the more complex responses uh that i do and then it seems to really go back to them working in unison with with one another that um they're constantly working in tandem and it, it started to remind me of like a uh a grid or um i guess almost like power lines or phone lines that are all connected and crisscross uh, across the world in some ways that um they're constantly working but never like independently uh necessarily and uh that reaching one means having to reach the other so that's been quite a quite an interesting discovery that's amazing. And I, I really hope, I know for myself, and I hope the listeners appreciate that grid format because it just shows that that interconnectedness. And I think, uh, Frater Chassan, this leads to uh, the first listener question that we have for you, which is from uh, Glitch Bottle patron Talha Mohammed. And Talha is asking and saying, hi, Frater Chassan, I love your work. My question is, what does it mean that, quote, the offices of these spirits are all in one. For what one can do, the others can do the same, unquote. I am confused because the first book of the Lamegaton, the Goetia, has very specific offices for each of the 72 spirits. Can you elaborate on this? And thank you, Talha says. Yeah, so it's a great question. And one of the questions that I put to the spirits and a question that I put to multiple spirits as, as I work, uh, work through the system is what does this mean? It says that you can, you can all pretty much do the same thing. And, uh, the responses that I've got is, uh, well, many of us can, but so we are specialized uh, in the form that, uh, we take depending on the needs and wants of those who call to us. And I was like, can you elaborate upon this? And they went on to say that, well, if your desire is, you know, for instance, you know, wealth. And uh, I would ask about different, you know, kind of practical aspects and magic. And they would say, then you need to work with us in this capacity, but you also have to contact this spirit. And, you know, we work in tandem for the manifestation of wealth and goods to come on to those who call us. And so it's almost like a, um, uh, almost like a puzzle or a, uh, <clears throat> an equation of working with these spirits and uh, also a very, um, I don't want to reveal it totally because I don't have the full equation down and, and I'm still discovering it, but how the, the sigils themselves of these spirits uh, can be used and how they're used in kind of like a, um, a practical, almost sym sympathetic, magical way of uh, working with them in a kind of grid or arrangement as you connect certain sigils together so that... Um, to me, it almost it reminded me of like electricity passing along um, a circuit board or something like that, that if you connect them in, in the right order and uh, you call them th through that, then it's going to to better manifest uh, what you're what you're trying to get. And uh, so it's been fascinating. And there's there's just so much to it that they're like, yes, in order to to bring about this in your life you know, call to us and then call to this one and make sure that you combine these two together and we will teach you how to work our offices and our seals together in order to bring about that which you seek, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so it's been very fascinating. Um, so they will do similar things, not exactly the same. It's like uh, each of them hits on, I don't know, a point within the matrix, a point within uh, the manifestation of reality that they are working uh, to change and to implement, to bring about certain things. And that, I guess, if you can figure out the right um, equation, they're going to work in tandem uh, to, to manifest that even uh, more effectively. And uh, I find that very fascinating. 
this just popped into my head, Frater Chassan, and um, you know, it's something that I think fits with this theme is when you describe grids and electricity, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, many of this of the sigils, correct me if I'm wrong, are derived from Tritemius and his uh, stenographia and, and how that was one of the first books effectively of cryptography, of writing hidden and coded messages. And I just can't help but think when, when you when I think of these things like Tritemius and cryptography and then you describing grids and networks and little nodes of connection and, and points, there just seems to be this kind of not electronic, but this kind of just giant, I think, as you said, this matrix-like structure. Would that be somewhat fair? I think that's an excellent way to put that. And to be honest, I'm I'm still pretty humbled. I feel like uh, I don't quite have the mind of uh, Tritemius and other, I can think of like mathematicians that if they were magicians would be far more excellent to, to me than this. But uh, it really does seem like these these spirits and these intelligences uh, the message and communication and the way that things are working through uh, through symbol and through intention and through, um, I guess, being able to, to focus and manipulate uh, whatever the intentionality is, if you can communicate with them properly and in contact and work with them that way, you're basically establishing, I guess, pathways of, of uh, causality. Um, to be able to achieve what it is that you're looking for. And I think it's, again, it reminds me of like a puzzle. You're putting it together the correct way um, as far as the way that they're trying to instruct. And it becomes, it becomes a language. It becomes a um, symbolized focus of, of intent and communication and uh, you know, basically effective outcome, which touches on magic itself. And I think that's the fascinating point of working with these spirits. So the uh, I think the elemental um, correspondence to them are kind of like they're they're set as a base. They're there, but uh, the they're far more kind of like aerial um, intellect. And um, I mean, it reminds me of very mercurial uh, type entities as well, just because they they seem to move quickly in that communication and affecting things in kind of a uh, a language type pattern. Uh, is is how they seem to function, at least from my experience of them. But um, putting that all together has, has been, um, I think it's going to take a lot more work on my part, but it's it's been fascinating. And that, I think, leads to this, Frater Chassan, which is there are so many things in the Theurgy of Goetia that are different, as, as you say, from the first book, the actual Goetia with the 72 well-known spirits with very specific offices. So there's so much that's different, but there's also so much that's the same. And I think we see this in the Materia Magica and some of the implements. So can you kind of describe what are some of the Materia Magica, the implements, the ritualistic paraphernalia that carry over from the first book of the Goetia into the Theurgia Goetia? Yeah, so it's, it's very much set in the same context where the everything from the the vestments and then regalia to the implements are really serving as to step into an authoritative position of the the working from from god from the highest uh source and that uh, it begins with the, the magical circle that it, itself which um beyond protection which i really have come to uh, agree with other magicians as well as as protection being its secondary function uh, it's establishment of a node of a, a working universe or a working um, paradigm of a cosmology is is first and foremost of where the magician really reaches out to these beings and where he establishes he establishes himself or herself uh, to reach out to these intelli intelligences and that the intelligences can recognize it back even though it's through symbology it really becomes an energetic. I think uh, understanding where they're they're communicating and seeing at a at a center point of working in the universe, uh, without trying to sound too um, <laughs> too complex, it's it's difficult to explain. But the the circle itself with the holy names is the establishment of an order of a cosmology um, of working things as as best that we can know in in a systematic approach from the highest intelligence. And then reaching out um, to these beings again with the vestments and symbols, even from you know the hexagram and and so many established uh, geometric and um, 
you know, highly established magical some symbology, especially when it's consecrated in that fashion, um, you're able to reach these beings and work with them, I think, in a more organized and systematic approach. It's it's something they seem to recognize. It's something that uh, they respond to. And then through that exchange, even though I, I don't think it has the complete full picture, I don't think there is a system that has everything complete. It's it's an understandable language and method of exchange where you know you can achieve uh, practical ends and you can learn knowledge along these established lines of communication of working with something that is quite intangible and that i think would seem quite chaotic and just um either insubstantial or too um too diverse to even understand um otherwise without these you know these established paradigms yeah, that's that's such a good point. And I remember one of the first podcasts that you were chatting about, uh, you know, these these esoteric tributaries and these circuits that you step into. So if if you have magicians who have been, you know, executing specific operations for hundreds of years, you're kind of stepping into that and that carryover. And yeah, so like the the lion skin belt, the goetic circle, if you will, carries over. But there's also so much that's different with the Theurgia Goetia, and you've you've touched on these a few, uh, Frater Chassan, and uh, please take as much time as you want. So I'm things that come to mind are the the 32 point compass rose, the directionality, the table, which I think is really fascinating, the the specific table that that you use and that you've done a very unique thing with, and also in the text itself mentions you know to appear you know outside the circle, but also the use of a crystal, which, you know, isn't one, you doesn't usually find that say in the first book of the Goetia. So the crystal, the rose, the table, can you share with us about these uh, different aspects of the Theurgia Goetia? Yes, it's been uh, fascinating and definitely a point of, um, I think there's some creative inspiration that comes into effect since the, uh, the second book itself doesn't tell exactly how to make uh, the table. It basically shows the quote unquote table of Solomon, which is um, simply like a, it looks like a plaque that uh, has been found in several sources, like the the magical calendar. And it's, it has this like stylized cross that has come to symbolize the wisdom of Solomon, the authority of Solomon. And I always like that. I, I even um, put that on like a shield as like a breastplate as further um, phylactery and armor for certain goetic workings. But um, it didn't say exactly how to make it. So I was like, well, there's, there's a crystal and there's uh, you got to set it on some sort of stand. Uh, so um, ebony was my choice since it's, it was used in the drawing spirits and the crystals. Um, I've come to really appreciate that uh, substance. And I decided to, to make it a, a four sided, I mean, six fight uh, cube or basically um rectangular uh type device but that had had four facing sides for the four directions since we were working with compass points so it showed uh, authority in those four main directions and on top is um basically a hole that was drilled and then the the triangle of solomon was engraved in the uh depression in, in the hole to show kind of still using a triangle of solomon to uh, seal and have the spirits be uh commanded and fixated into one point. So that was something else that came to mind. And uh, I was able to work with a, uh, another magical friend and, and uh, talented artist and computer whiz. And um, he got an engraver where we were able to uh, really make a 3D model of the uh, the Table of Solomon on all four sides, which was nice. The uh, the crystal ball, I believe it's, uh, it's four inches. So it's like a little bit bigger than what you find in other systems. It's a little bit more visible. But um, I decided to use the uh, just a, a nice stand to put um, the circular compass rose table on. And uh, this is something that's also imaged in uh, the grimoire that just shows all the compass points and uh, where the uh, the spirits, the main rulers are attributed to each. Their names are, are shown on, on these points. So I was like, well, this looks like something that should be uh, part of the holy table or at least table of working from this uh, from this aspect, from this art. And so we decided to make um, a really fine version of uh, the compass rose table. And uh, I set the stand directly in the center and 
I'm able to call the spirits uh, directly, but I've got enough space to um, put an incense burner right below it so that the the fumes come up right next and in front of the crystal. And I uh, experimented of putting the whole stand and the table and the crystal uh, in uh, a triangle of Solomon as well that I use for Goetia. And uh, I've experimented with that quite a few times and it seems to work quite well. So yeah, a few different um, implements and, and regalia, but it, uh, they've seemed to work really well so far. That's that's lovely. And and Frater Chassan, I think this is such a deep lesson that that's kind of been a theme with with all of your writings and and posts and and podcasts that that we've done is you it is possible two things can be true at the same time. You can ha- show fidelity to a tradition and follow a grimoire, but just like you did with the altar of stars and drawing spirits into crystals, um, and and just like now, there are these beautiful opportunities for innovation and inspiration. And I just think that's such a powerful and deep lesson that I, I know myself, and I, I really hope that the listeners uh, take to heart as well. Um, and for Otter too, as you mentioned, directionality is so important. You know, very specific directions, elemental associations, but which seems to be a theme with Ethiopia Goetia, it seems to be a paradox in many ways because there are these other spirits called the wandering dukes that are not bound, it seems, by any direction. And so to that point, we have a listener question for you, Frater, from Glitch Bottle patron Sarah Marjorie. And Sarah is asking and saying, Frater Chassan, directionality is so important in the Theurgia Goetia, something I know Dr. Stephen Skinner mentions often, but the wandering dukes seem to not be bound by directionality at all. Can you share about the nature, Frater, of the Wandering Dukes and any interactions that you've had with them? Thank you. Yeah, so this is this is part of the, the fascinating point about the system is that these Wandering Dukes and exactly what that means and then asking them and their responses as well too is um, dual, um, dual directionality and also dual, um, I guess, you could say elemental correspondence. So when I spoke to them and hopefully translating what they've been, they've been telling me is that they um, each in their system, that they are not of one singular um, point movement or, or office, but that their office is shared between and that they move back and forth between uh, these points. And, and that is their office is to, to be able to exchange back and forth and also change. They said their natures and their office depending on, on their call, depending on their duty at the time. So um, that they are sent and that they are worked specifically to change. And it is in their, their malleable nature, but it, it, I guess it still is in a very systematic ways. It's not uh, uh chaotic or, or anywhere. They have very specific points that they move and change back and, and to and from, and that it starts to, again, it just reminds me of a grid from them trying to explain, well, I move from this direction and then from this season and this time or from this intention, I move over here and then I'm, I am I need to move back in, in order for the actual f- effect to change their their actual movement or their their energetic um, their energetic transformation or change. I mean, if we want to look at it from a direction uh, that the, the process of them changing is the causality that actually makes makes something happen that brings about the effect of what they're supposed to do or what somebody's asking them for so that these dukes and everything are almost like the um uh what's the word I'm looking for the catalyst or something that um is going to bring about in some of these effects and that they work with these other spirits it's it's very fascinating how they're they're basically instructed or called to change between these points and uh yeah, that's so far as my knowledge, and it's it's still a little vague, but uh, that's been the explanation that um, I've received, and it's very fascinating to see how they work. So their their sigils and their seals are um, needed to be plugged into uh, in between some of these these other spirits in order for things to effectuate properly. If I'm understanding the the process correctly, that is so lovely, and. This just popped into my head too, Frater Chassan, but 
when it comes to, again, I'm, I'm thinking of a grid of a matrix of some kind of, you know, trillion threaded computer ones and zeros, kind of very intricate. And if, if, if anyone's out there doubting the intricacy of this, can you talk about the sheer number of spirits that are mentioned? I mean, you know, this Duke has 60 million spirits underneath. I mean, we're, we're talking mil- hundreds of millions, maybe, of spirits that are listed. I, I don't know if anyone's ever added them up, but can you talk about the number and, and how that fits into this whole theme of precision, change, mercurial elements, anything with, with the sheer number of spirits? Yeah, and, the, and I asked them about the number as well too, and they, you know, they told me try not to focus on on each or the you know, the context of of each is that it would be too many, but to look at it in the uh, in ways of uh, quantifiable force behind uh, what is one and what is being asked for, and one what their purpose and their office is. So um, I, it's it's very hard. I get they're probably explaining it to me in ways that I can understand, but. Every time it's like, okay, so this is like an energy dial, like putting it up. So how many, how many amps or, you know, voltage is, is needed behind that because they're all working in tandem or working with one another and possibility they each have their distinct intelligences, but they're all go- geared towards a, um, a specific uh, goal and office. And basically the, the names that are mentioned in the rulers above are, are ones that can, um, handle complex or more complex interaction and discussion and uh, um, achievements of kinds. And then all the ones mentioned below are basically the, the ones that are running along these, these energetic lines of reality or the, the threads of, of reality and, and making the adjustments and moving things in a particular way as they all work together. So um, yeah, very fascinating uh, in that way. And, and that, I think that's the only way I can understand it now is, is kind of like, um, the numbers of spirits and the, you know, the millions of spirits, uh, basically exhibit the kind of power that each of them has, or that they can move along one, one common line of, uh, achievement. Well, I know myself, Frater Chasan, I'm sure the listeners will, will keep our ear to the ground on any updates that you have for your fascinating workings with this, because this is just, it's got my mind going in so many different directions, which is awesome. And shifting gears here a little bit, Frater Chasan, um, regarding social media. I think this is a really interesting topic. And before we do, for, for those watching on, on YouTube, I'm going to hold up a card that you reference, Frater, in your Skills of the Ceremonial Magician class, which we'll make sure to put the contact info below in the video and podcast descriptions if you'd like to check out Frater's uh, excellent courses. Cannot recommend them enough. Um But in one of your first classes, I won't give everything away, but you discuss the magician card and you talk about how before you do, before you step into a circle, before you wish to, you know, deck yourself out in specific regalia and and feel, you know, kind of embody this, you say, no, if you really want to enter into the office of the magician, you have to work on yourself first. And that's embodied in the card, the kind of uh, uniting of earth and heaven. So before we get to social media, uh, Frater Chasan, can you just share with us a little bit about this card, which I know so many people are familiar with. I'll make sure to, uh, it's it's up here on the screen right now, but what are some of the key things about purifying yourself and working on yourself first before you engage with advanced Solomonic procedures? What would you like people to know? Well, first and foremost, I've, I've spent so much time thinking about the role of the magician as um, basically a, you know, label and, and a, a word that has so many connotations, but something that's relatable in nearly all cultures of mankind. Um, and, you know, shaman was used be, before and just a, basically people that feel uh, called to this or are basically immersed in this world of having one foot in the, in the physical and one foot in the spiritual and uh, it all it first comes with a a journey, and it's a journey found in um, the cas- uh, classical Greek uh, works. It's in the Bible. It's uh, the journey of uh, Jesus, and uh, you really find that that people, if they, if they're really called uh, to this kind of work, especially with working with spirits, uh, there is a journey that that takes place, and usually there is a a death and rebirth scenario. Uh, many people that have found themselves 
to this calling have um, gotten extremely ill and really touched on that edge of death. Um, some have even been in a coma or have gotten an accident. And when they came back out of it, um, they found that that connection to the spiritual world uh, was established and it's extremely difficult. There's nothing easy or, or glamorous about it, but um, this, this role, this journey of uh, learning to stand between worlds is I think something to really, really look about and then, or to, to think about, and the magician pointing to to heaven and earth is really establishing um, a place that that harkens back to um, my background in, in Japanese uh, arts, not just uh, Reiki, but some of the other mystical traditions. And uh, there's a concept called Tenchijin, and it's man between heaven and earth. And the old kanji of of um, Reiki actually shows a person between the heavens and the earth. And um, it's not just meant to show somebody, you know, standing on the ground. It really is showing somebody that is connected both to the celestial and the unseen world of the gods above, uh, but also firmly established on the earth. And uh, the magician is somebody that, that mediates between these two worlds that um, for a lot of people, uh, that connection is not seen, it's not perceived or realized. And uh, I think that it's so important, this symbology that it's, it's cross cultures and languages and such, it, it really shows somebody who's able to, to tap into both. Uh, there's some mystics and such that get swept away and they're, they remove themselves or aesthetic. And I think that's that, that purpose, but they want to remove themselves entirely from the physical world and not have anything to do with it to escape the wheel of rebirth or what have you. They're trying to get away from the physical. Um, it's like the old Gnostics as, as well, uh, and escape the, the evilness of, of the, the material world. There is something to be said for that, but that's not the role of the magician. Absolutely not. As Dr. Steven Sanders says, you know, that magic has its practical purposes. It's if you're doing magic, you're you're manipulating things in order to achieve and have practical practical things in your life and the lives of others that's the role of of magicians so being able to do that successfully is is not easy uh working on yourself and and understanding how to to keep that connection to the celestial while not losing yourself in the material or not totally disregarding the material in favor of the spiritual it's it's a difficult balancing act, but a balancing act it is for the magician for sure. And uh, there's so much symbology, and I could go on uh, with it for sure. But I think um, taking time from each, just like working through yourself and going into the microcosm, and then being able to extend things out to to consider all the important aspects dealing with the macrocosm and keeping that relationship going. I think is the um, the biggest thing with uh, with the role of the magician by far, and uh, all of this work begins and ends there. Whether you're doing Solomonic magic, um, other folk traditions, I think it remains the same. That um, keeping keeping those relations between the two worlds with you in the center is an ongoing balancing act. It's an ongoing struggle. Um, it's something that uh, re requires constant attention and imbalance happens. It's bound to happen. If you're living imbalance is going to happen. And uh, that's part of the point, but continuing in that role and that work is always re reestablishing the balance between. And to your very point, Frater Chassan, one of the first things that you engage with in the grimoires, you know, whether it is say, you know, the heptameron drawing spirits into crystals, but one of the themes is purification, fasting, as, as you say, kind of achieve, if there is an imbalance, correcting it, connecting to the divine, whatever that source is that you can connect with and unite. And to this very point, you are, have shared before about something that is so key, which is Many grimoire practitioners are very focused, say, on fasting with food or, you know, withdrawing themselves from, say, day-to-day -day conversations in person. But so many of us 
forget about the important social media fast, especially in a world where it seems that we are so obsessed with doom scrolling and constant hours and blue screen light hitting our eyes before bed, messing up sleep schedules. Like There's so many things that, that people know about, but as a ceremony magician, can you share with listeners about what is a social media fast? Why is taking a step back from all of the you know, seeming just heightened everything, emotions and drawing you in and everything. Why is it so important to have a social media fast as well? I think speaking beyond just a, a personal um, you know, endeavor to be healthier and to take a step back, you can even speak about it from a point of of being a practitioner in magic and understanding that especially in today, you have many talented minds, uh, magicians and scholars, and there's new discoveries and translations and things that are going on. We can narrow it down just to the magical world or even further to uh, the grimoire world where these these discoveries and, and uh, debates and things are going on all the time. And it's fascinating and it's wonderful. We have so much access to, to uh, knowledge and uh, things that we just didn't have before. It just wasn't there. We didn't have access to it. And and people can't do everything. Um, so you have sp- specialists working on on different areas. And uh, even for myself, I loved and I want to know. But I do find that um, if I stay online and within the groups and even talking to you know my colleagues and everything, if I spend too much time, it seems like, well, there's, there's always something more to learn or there's something always new being discovered. And there's something that well, this was a mistake in translation and it's it's over here. And uh, it's easy to get wrapped into a sense of, okay, I can't quite practice this until I have the full, complete, total and perfect picture. And uh, I don't think that's, I think that's a trap. I think that's n- not a possibility. And uh, so many people that are interested in um, magical works are hesitant to, to put things to, um, to actual practice because it's it's going to be imperfect or there's going to be a newer translation or there's going to be a different way that seems better or a new book that seems better or a different philosophy from another magician that seems better. And uh, I think this is narrowing it down even to this field as um, taking a break away from that social media, even though it's fascinating, uh, it can be a draw and that in itself can be an addiction of um, just wanting to exist and and participate in that and and not get to actual practice um many of the things that i've i've done for years as far as the knowledge and and how things are appreciated now is is completely uh, uh, outdated like uh, how is working from the almadel uh, there's much more understanding about you know the tablets and such that worked before and the angels and different incense mixtures and you know things like that but um but i'm glad i did it when i did otherwise i may not have have experienced what i did and um, those experiences, if I can give um, you know some hope, other readers is that it's it's not in the perfect uh, the perfect art. It's not having all of the information uh, infallible and everything. I think that's that's a trap. It is really involving yourself in the practice that you're doing. There is some trust there, and there's um, there's going to be mistakes made. I don't know a perfect magical practitioner. I definitely am not. I'm still learning uh, all the time. I'm just appreciating the knowledge and the experiences that I'm having as they evolve. And uh, being able to also step away from the purely academic and social media of other people is that um, this magic is is about involving yourself into a realm where it is, it is the unknown. Uh, people always want to do magical experiences or they have this idea that they're going to go in with all the knowns really there. And that's, I don't think that's this type of magic that's not going to work. Uh, it really is going into the unknown, knowing that mistakes will be made and involving yourself anyways, and learning via experience and perception rather than, um, ap- am- academic knowledge and, um, you know, just, just thinking it's all go- going to be, um, a rational type experience. Um, so there is that. And then of course, stepping away from, you know, other social and uh, media engagements that may have your attention. Um, it's difficult to juggle everything, but um, 
it is a it is a fast from that. It is a, an ability to step away. Um, and sometimes it can be hard because it feels like we're, we're missing something or what if I'm doing this and there's this big discovery and, and I'm not even aware of it. Um, and I've had to do that. I've, I've stepped away from things for a while and come back. I'm like, wow, look at all these things that have been discovered. And I wasn't even aware of, I have to catch up and I, and I'm still catching up, um, academically to a lot of things that are in my field that I should be knowledgeable in, but, um, it's still kind of a sacrifice and something that um, I don't feel bad making it. Cause for, for me, it really is still the experience and uh, the immersion of doing the art, even if it is, you know, imperfect in, in some ways. I've loved that. Frater Shasan. It's, it's like wisdom is not the same thing as knowledge. You know, knowledge is great. It's beautiful scholarly connections and Hey, this new word and this, and that's all awesome. But two things can be true at the same time. It's the wisdom of direct experience that is so, so amazing. I love that point, Frater Chassan. I, I really hope uh, the listeners out there appreciate that too. It's so vital. And also, Frater Chassan, can you talk about the importance of fasting, not only from social media and the algorithms and everything there, but also stepping back from other media, you know, uh, music or you know, movies. I mean, can you share about why it's a problem where let's say you're in the middle of a nine day purification. It's day five. You've just got done with your, you know, hours of meditation and prayers and everything and specific, you know, angelic invocation, whatever it is, you step out of your uh, specific sacred space and then you sit down on the couch and watch the latest thing from Netflix. It's just bombarding. Can you talk about why this is a a problem from the fasting perspective? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, it definitely is, especially in, in our culture. I think it's it's more difficult on in this aspect than than ever before. And it is just because we've become very accustomed to constant stimuli, constant uh with our, our phones, um with we can call up any any media or inter, in entertainment that we want in less than a second and be able to fill our times and, and our minds with that. And specifically the, the issues lie in that um, that addiction, like, like others is um, mulling over deeper processes that we have in our minds, our emotions and our bodies and uh, perceptions. So we're, we're talking about a lot of the reasons for meditation and for taking time in silence and space uh, sitting in space to know. And uh, you can't know uh, if everything is covered up by um, our thoughts, by medias, by, you know, things that we've watched or experienced by the stimuli that our brain is constantly processing as a distraction. And uh, they very much are distractions and it takes, it takes effort. I would say more effort than, um, now than than ever before to step away from that and to have enough time and enough space to to be with ourselves and uh this is difficult for a lot of people because even with with these spirits um it requires mental space it requires emotional space uh, we have to have room for our perceptions to to perceive them to communicate with them properly it's not easy um, with some more practice, uh, you know, it's it, you're able to to recognize um, the points where we're we've got chatter and distraction, and then the points where there are spirits coming through to communicate with us. But that's something that I think can only develop through consecutive uh, success with these kind of arts and and lear learning to distinguish between the two. Uh, so especially in the beginning, but then continually, yeah, being able to step back and and have um, a space for ourselves, because regardless, even if we're talented at at um, achieving um, communication with these spirits, to be able to process what they're they're trying to communicate to us, to be able to contemplate and um, I think digest properly the knowledge and feedback that's coming back to us. Um, the more unfiltered uh, that we can, you know, we can perceive them and hear them, the better. And uh, when we have other distractions and a lot of these things going through our minds, regardless, all of us, my, definitely myself included, 
um, we're going to be running through those other filters about things that we watch, things that we, you know, experience, things that we were chatting online about, so on and so forth. So, yeah, that fasting just for like food and everything. <laughs> Another thing is it's it's nice to have some space within our system um, to have room. It's basically that full cup scenario. It's it's hard to fill a cup that's overflowing at the brim with all kinds of stuff and to bring that back. So we need space in our cup to actually make make it worth it, make um, what we learn from these spirits worth it for us and for others if we're doing things for other people. That's that's amazing wisdom because how often exactly are we so caught up in things and even subconsciously just realizing a, a little ding on your phone, a little hit of dopamine here, a little scrolling there, and then all of a sudden you're you're sucked into this kind of spider webian, you know, uh, entanglement, I suppose. Um, and something too that you've touched on in the past, Frater Chasan, which is so important. I, I love this is. When it comes to when you do log log online and when you are in a forum and chatting with people, oftentimes you might see um, healthy discussion, which is great. But other times you might see this kind of fighting back. No, this is the way that a nomina magica or this is a way that that this equipment needs to be laid out or this or no, you're wrong. So w- with all of this, can you just give the listeners out there, if they are chatting uh, online in forums and things like that, what are some tips to just, you know, either maintain a healthy distance or to engage respectfully? I think having respect is so important. Any any tips there that you might have? Yeah, this is a big area uh, for sure, especially within the the magical community and <clears throat> especially as uh, more scholarly works and and uh, where languages and customs and, um, you know, religious undertonings are, are a factor. There can be a lot of uh, debate uh, for this. And it's, it's hard for not to let certain egos get in the way. But um, what I've found is that academic discussion and debate is, is awesome. If it's done in the proper context, we're constantly learning uh, my pronunciations and, and the ways that I'm looking at magical arts that I uh, had done stuff, even successfully, I can still learn from and it can still update and um, increase my knowledge but it hasn't stopped me from practicing or considering things that I was doing as wrong or inaccurate. Um, a lot of these things, people get caught on certain details and and are missing the overall uh, practice, um, which might sound funny coming from me because I can be highly detailed uh, oriented, especially um, where it comes to classical magic. Um, honestly, I think I was even more, structured and a little bit more um a little more critical of uh, certain things even before i gained the experience and then through experience i see the sacredness the the importance and uh basically the the authenticity of of what you're doing but uh as far as the um the stringent uh you know, adherence to certain, to certain aspects. Um, I think people get stuck on, on points and I did uh, as well at some point, but um, yeah, for others listening, especially if, if they're not highly involved in an art um, in magic is I would say that to, to pick, pick a topic or pick something that interests you and, and, um, and really try to stick with it and, and not always look for the, the latest update or the, the um you know the most accurate practitioner version even with people who come to me and everything i, I tell them it's not the only way to achieve communications with spirits there's there's other ways there's i do things a particular way because it's it's evolved through my practice and it seems to really work for me um but um they're they're always going to hear debates and and about things being able to be uh more accurate or more this or more that um i think it is important to to have integrity to what with what you're doing and to be patient especially if you're new and to keep practicing without um digging your heels in uh about what it is that you're doing and then trying to speak authoritatively about it before you've had the experiences under your belt so to speak uh that is a big one but um it's it can be hard to who do i listen to who you know which person should i pay attention to and um i would say 
to look to to people that actually involve themselves practically as well as academically so that they have both backing. But um, once once chosen, work from that particular point of view, work from that aspect and get more experience before going back to, you know, confirm if all of your academic research is is correct or in agreement with this other person over here, this other timeline. Um, it's it's a big uh, it's a big topic. It can get confusing. So um yeah <laughs> it's 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 hard to to speak to uh, to every point on that but yeah i think it's important to to make sure just to to practice once you get going that's would it be fair to say this is kind of how i think of it too to follow your excellent point frater chasan is if you pick any grimoire drawing spirits into crystals if you take a hundred people and they're all practicing let's say a ritual of drawing spirits into crystals you are going to get 100 different, unique, idiosyncratic ways that those 100 people approach it. It's not cookie cutter. You know, someone's the the tonality and the invocation, the construction of the tools, the timing, everything is a personal stamp of you. It's, it's, it's not about meeting some cookie cutter guideline of, oh, you didn't show fidelity to the grimoire in this one specific point, or, oh, you added on to it. You know, it's, is, would that be fair to say that it really is about you as a unique individual? It is. And and what I, I love about, I guess, one of the positive points of, of coming together is that I, I have seen a collaborative effort uh, between serious magicians to to share as well and say that, you know, even though these different points might be slightly different or I did it this way or intoned the holy name this way. Uh, what I do love to see is when things are the same. Hey, I had the experience of this angel. I experienced that same thing. Oh, these seem like this this way to me. Yeah, that's that sounds very familiar to what I experienced. And uh, even though there's there's going to be variations between how the angels or spirits uh, appear to people, um, what I do love to, to hear is, is when prior students or other working magicians, they share their experiences with me. And I'm like, yep. I mean, I, you know, you never know 100%, but that sounds so, you know, familiar or hitting the same points. It's It's awesome to see you know, people doing the work, and even if it is uh, slightly different, that they're they're achieving similar ends. Um, those those points are, are happy points <laughs> to me that that show things in effort. And uh, where there's where there's human beings, there's going to be variations. I think that's the point. Um, none of this is is meant to to be in the, um, kind of a vacuum or a sterile environment. Um, I think there's ways to have great integrity. Uh, with the arts and the systems that um, you're choosing to practice with, uh, for sure, and that have very important points that if we we change it or we disregard it without having experience first, we're going to miss some important aspects, uh, for sure. But um, you know, the people that do practice in these ways and and share their experiences, um, I think, yeah, regardless, the the variation is fascinating but also the the similarities is is wonderful to hear as well so yep there's always there's so much back and forth with it awesome that's just such a great point and and stepping stepping into the into the circle or into the ritual or into the mindset and not not being chained back by hesitation or this is the wrong grimoire oh i'm gonna wait 10 years until there's an updated version or something like that and and just having that that felt presence of direct experience. I think that's, that's so great. Um, Friday Chasan too, of course, uh, we'll definitely chat a little bit about, you know, your projects, your, your classes, uh, you know, how people can, can support you, but we do have several listener questions for you here, kind of general topic questions. So feel free to take these in, in any direction that you would like. Um, we have a listener question for you from glitch bottle patron Maria, who is asking and saying, uh, Frater Chasan, in the Lesser Key of Solomon, it is stated that some of the spirits lie. However, it also says that they will give you information for the future or knowledge that you wish to obtain. So Maria is asking, how does Frater Ashen Chasan appear in authority before the spirits to ensure that they will not lie to him? Yeah, so this it's a great question. So the, the grimoire structure itself, the magical process, the art... Uh, deals with this this question or this issue, this problem directly, and uh, it's part of the the layout and process of of binding the spirit to 
to tell the truth, uh, to speak into a clear manner and not to beguile and not to, um, you know, try basically to lie to the magician. And this is all set within the invocation itself uh, to begin with that states this many times over, uh, usually kind of changing the wording again, kind of like an illegal document to say that, hey, you're you're meant to appear and to speak audibly and clearly in a, in a voice that I can understand and not to beguile uh, or liar or, or um, you know, do things that are going to, to try to trick me. And then the, the process of showing the sacred seal of Solomon or the hexagram of Solomon is meant to have them obey and show directly. It's a, it's a badge. Okay. This is of divine authority. And this is something that you have to recognize and acknowledge as being a direct authority over you to not to lie or to present any falsehoods and to be the spirit that you claim to be so on and so forth. This is part of the Solomonic magical process in dealing with spirits and uh, where some people, they, they see it as either harsh or, um, you know, a bit too authoritative or diplomatic, but this developed in this way on purpose to make sure that you're dealing in, with the spirit in the proper way that you know it, it's it's the proper one that you evoked and also that it's going to speak with you in a manner that you can one understand and two that is going to be genuine and and not of falsehoods um so the the whole binding the presentation of the uh, the sacred seal and then uh, confirming it within the triangle uh the triangle psalm is specifically for um, it's not for manifesting the spirit. It's not for uh, generating. Sometimes they can appear right over it or within it, what have you. But its primary function is to have it speak and declare things truthfully. And also, when you're asking it to do something, that it is bound to do so in a trustworthy and direct manner. Uh, this is all important because dealing with spirits is uh, a tricky business. Whether angel. Uh, or demon or goetic or however um, you speak to is that a lot of the way that I think our minds and um, I say the minds or the intellect of these spirits uh, are not the same thing. They're not human. And so there's um, there's going to be some things lost between the exchange or some things that um, are different. You may ask questions about the future and you're expecting very um, direct, almost data-based answers back very few, if any, of these spirits give replies back that are simple, you know, straight data, you know, yes or no, in this very clear manner. Um, and I think even today, as it was seen before, a lot of times this was perceived on this spirit is trying to trick me, or it's trying to, you know, give me a falsehood, or it's trying to beat around the bush. And um, from my experience, I don't think that is the case. Uh Honestly, I think the information or the perceptions or basically how the spirit's able to communicate certain things back, it doesn't come across like that. The, the reality or the, the way that it understands um, how information comes across isn't the same way as it is for us. It's not perceived the same way. So it's going to give us um, its replies, in the, I think, in the best way that one, we can understand of how it's trying to communicate with us. And to the way that um, it, the being itself, pro I don't know, processes the information or is able to give it, give it back to us. So there's a lot of, of things going on there. And I think that's where a lot of the confusion um, comes from when dealing with spirits. And I've had to take it as a matter of course, because some things I'll, I'll get fairly direct. Some things I'll get in an analogy type form or accompanied with visions and, and perceptions uh, and images of things that I didn't quite understand at first. And all of this was important. Uh, it just wasn't something that I could completely put together and understand in, in a rational way right away. And that's why I think sometimes follow-up questions or um, especially for a magician, the way that questions are presented to a spirit or angel is very important. And it might make sense to us, or it might seem like the perfect way to ask for us, but it may not be appropriate or the 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 most constructive ways to to put it to a spirit. And uh, this, I think, is a whole art form in and of itself. Is is how you communicate 
uh, with a spirit and how you ask your questions, how you present your questions. And most importantly, how you ask for things when you want them to change something in your life. Um, how you ask for that is, is highly, highly important uh, because it, it might be something that makes sense to us or we imagine to be a certain way, but in reality, dealing with the spirit, it's, it's much different. And I think this is some of the biggest um, upsets and problems that um, many magicians can attest to that has uh, created a learning curve for, for asking for things from spirits. Yes. Yes. I know that there have been stories that maybe we've read online of some magicians who uh, we won't name anybody, but just that they've asked for something and then they got it, but it was completely different or deleterious in a way that, that might've been a little bit off what they were thinking, but Ryder, that's such a, it's such a beautiful and subtle point. And I really hope, you know, listeners, I hope you appreciate that as much as I do because, and this is an overly, I'm being overly dramatic here, Frater Chassan, but basically what you're saying is if it says that a spirit lies, say in the Lamegatons Goetia or the Grimoire, it it very well might be not because it's an intentional malicious lie, but because the information, the concept of the information is being distilled and, and shared with the operator in a way that the spirit is sharing, but to us and our mammalian, you know, subjective, uh, you know, senses, uh, you know, our, our hearing, our sight, our thoughts, it has to filter through that. So by the time it gets to us, we may be like, well, this spirit, you know, I asked the spirit where the gold was buried and it started talking to me about the cosmos and time. And it clearly is lying. And I'm going to write that in the Goetia, but you're saying no, th this very well could be a communication where the spirit's communicating one thing and we're, the way we receive it can be totally different. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. And sometimes they, yeah, they will go around and kind of almost like a, um, <clears throat> uh, it almost seems like circumventing or uh, circumventing, you know, the, the topic or something at first, but it, it really is about connecting various points that it, at first it won't make sense to us or won't seem relevant. And um, it is interesting, but again, that's why the the invocations and I think the, the process and structure of uh, Solomonic magic is so useful and important now, not, not from the, the kind of naive look of like, well, the spirit is going to try to trick me or harm me and such otherwise some can. And I, I do think some, even especially in the Goetia that, due to their very nature and everything could lead people on a wild goose chase or make things extremely difficult for them because that's their nature. But that most of the time it is that um, you're taking two very different um, embodiments of intelligence uh, and you're trying to have an exchange uh, across basically different languages, even though it comes across as a language you recognize and that you're familiar with. But uh, being able to relate topics um, to different minds uh, completely and that um, that's not an easy exchange. It's a very, very difficult thing. And, and the biggest thing that people, the biggest problem that people run into is assuming that uh, the spirit, this non-tangible entity is, is another person and that um, they're going to communicate and understand you as another person. Um, and I think that's an error. So uh, it takes uh, it takes a, a while to uh, really understand and, and come to a, a common knowledge. And I think that's why working with the same spirit over and over again, that more benefits are understood because the communication, I think there's a maybe a learning curve on both the, the part of the spirit and the magician that the, the communication is, is established and better understood through familiarity through working with one another over time and that that shared exchange develops the actual beneficial properties that a magician can harness through the spirit through that that frequent exchange and that it's something that is developed it's not immediate it's not um, instantaneous um, or achieved over just one one encounter um, so yeah very much so that's absolutely excellent excellent advice to keep in mind so many so many beautiful and subtle points. Uh, Frater, too, when it comes to tips for people who are just getting ready for their first ritual, you've you've already covered so many key things, you know, social media fasting, taking some time, clearing mental space, showing sincerity, showing devotion. But 
Is there anything else that that's coming to mind for you? We have a listener question from Maria who is asking, what advice can Frater Chassan give to those who are just about to perform their first goetic ritual? What are the crucial things that must be considered during the preparation or the ritual performance itself based on Frater's own experience? Definitely. And the biggest one is to move past imagination and expectation. That's the biggest one beyond all doubt. And uh, the biggest one for me is that um, I met my biggest failures and such where um, I couldn't get, I couldn't do, differentiate between uh, what I imagined in my head, how things would be and how the actual workings and communications uh, would be. And again, it comes from having that space and it's kind of a, uh, again, a balancing act, if not kind of a, a paradoxical appreciation of um, having determination, even point past the points of perceived failure and working with expectation of success, but not with expectation of imagined success. And um, to better understand and explain that, um, working with the the expectation of success that um, what you're doing is legitimate, that it's working that the that the spirits are going to you know arrive even if you don't perceive them at first. And um, continue with that over and over again, learning the art itself, learning to be familiar with the art, even if you're not achieving the results that you wanted of being able to see them and to hear them, but to keep going um, regardless as if you're succeeding and learning in that. I don't mean about imagining that the spirit is there, imagining that certain things are happening, but uh, knowing that what you're doing is... um, is profitable even if it's not achieving your first imagining your first imagined uh, success of of perceiving the spirit and doing it over and over again until the process itself if nothing else is very familiar and a part of something that you can do quite naturally and then i think uh, the results and um you know the spirit communication will will follow success um after so having that space um kind of getting out of your mind of imagination and going through the the process knowing that what you're doing is is um for one sacred and and legitimate and uh achieving its purpose um but not jumping ahead to we we all want to jump ahead to oh, it's going to be so excited you know when the spirit arrives or when this happens or that happens uh i did the same thing and um it is a little bit of dividing the mind a bit to uh, allow um, space and allow the spirit to arrive kind of on its on its terms and um our mind and and sometimes our, our perceptions can kind of get in the way because if we sit there after invocations and, and i've heard this so many times from clients and it reminds me of some of my earlier workings where we do the invocation and it's that time when they're supposed to arrive and you know it's quiet we're not really seeing anything and even though it can be just a, a few minutes we can get so so antsy or so discouraged or so nervous that uh, oh, it's not working and um, you know jump to conclusions um yeah it's a little bit tricky that way but uh, that would be my my early, early advice would be to stick with the um stick with the integrity of what you're doing and don't try to jump the gun but allow the imagination and that um that other part of the mind that wants to fill in the gaps Find a way to set that to the side and just allow the experience to be very genuine in, in what happens. And one of the ways, Frater Chasan, that you talk about how the journey is the destination in many ways, meaning like instead of just being focused on a manifestation, you know, in a Lasuskian sense where you have this full-blown manifestation and this, this crown of glory comes upon you and you're declared the greatest magician, you know, whatever egoic things we might think. What you talk about is every step of the grimoire process is so valuable and and needed and necessary and has to be approached, whether it's, you know, preparatory prayers, consecrating and, and crafting um, materia magica, which you know, you are constantly sharing this amazing ability of crafting and, you know, pentacles and materia magica. And to that point, Frater Chasan, we have another listener question for you from Maria, who is asking, 
uh, does Frater Chassan use a lion skin belt from uh, from the first rituals? And how did Frater Chassan tailor the belt to look sturdy and well crafted? So, do you have any tips? Whether it's a, a lion skin belt, Frater Chassan, or or any any belts used, any any tips or or crafting approaches regarding that? Yeah, so they I've I've used my lion skin skin belt for quite a while now, and I do have to um, uh, credit. Uh, Mr. John King and such for um, really giving me the inspiration to uh, to craft this. He goes into a little bit about how he made his, and and I might made mine very um, in a in a similar fashion where the the length is, um, or I should say, the diameter is the same diameter as a magic circle. So mine is is nine feet long. So it wraps around as as a girdle as, as opposed to just a belt that uh, matches my waistline, so to speak. And uh, it is three inches broad, as the uh, the grimoire uh, dictates. And uh, what I did was um, I put a, a leather sealant. There's leather dressings that you can get at any kind of, uh, if there's a leather store in your area, or it can be purchased online that can make the, the belt a lot uh, more durable uh, over time. But uh, before I put the dressing on, uh, I did a couple things. One is uh, I made sure that the edges um, were sewn. So I put it through a uh, sewing machine to make sure that the it wouldn't fray or the leather wouldn't come apart on its three three inches um, wide um, length and then or um, the nine nine foot length and the three inches uh, broad. And uh, then I wrote the names uh, actually um, kind of leather burned uh, the names in uh, ancient Hebrew on the outside, I was just very drawn to that. And then I filled it in with a red ink on the outside where I left a little bit of the, the fur. Uh, and uh, I did it this way. Not everybody um, that has the lion skin belt that I know of, some of the, they've shaved it down and have just the, the leather on both sides. But I have very short of uh, the, the lion skin fur. I just think added a little bit of, um, I don't know, uh, nostalgia <laughs> that we were actually being from a lion, uh, but I could still see the lettering through on the outside. And then on the reverse side, I did uh, the more modern Hebrew and then Latin translations of the circle names on the inside. This was just a personal, personal preference. Um, I just wanted to have it that way. And then uh, I um, it didn't say in the grimoire, but I actually added um like uh, tassels or I think they kind of like a bullion kind of um, ends to the belt just to kind of give it a little bit more of a, a fancy belt uh, type look. And then I did uh, sew in a border on uh, each side of my lion skin belt uh, that is um, a fabric. And this is again, not something that's listed in the grimoire. I don't think it's necessary at all, but it just kind of looks fancier so that I still have my three inch lion skin, but um, on the edge is this, um, this cotton bordering uh, that I got at a, um, um, a fabric shop um, that makes it look like a, a fancy belt, but it also keeps the belt together <clears throat> because the skin isn't, uh, the leather isn't super thick and it wraps around me, but it's, it's held up over many, many years. Um, trying to think when I actually made it, uh, it must have been uh, the early 2000s at some point, but it's it's held up uh, through, I guess it's over 20 years now, almost just about so um, through constant use and it's it's kept it together. And then I, I put the sealant, uh, the leather dressing um, over that. And this has helped protect the names that I did in ink. And uh, luckily they haven't rubbed off. That would have been a problem if it got all over my, my white linen alb uh, and such, but having... Uh, having that leather dressing over and sealant is kept from the the names from rubbing off and also coming off on my on my alb. So that's definitely something that I recommend, and it also preserves the leather and keeps it um, durable over time. Listeners, I, I hope you can uh, appreciate and just pick up on that that devotion, that sincerity, that that craftsmanship that Frater Chasson has, because it's, it's to me it's a such a powerful lesson for all of us to whether it's a sword, whether it's oils, whether it's getting the the four, you know, consecrating the the salt and the water and the chrism and getting those foundational things, all of that being approached with that that sincerity that is so lovely, Frater Chasson. And in in the spirit that you're always uh, obviously engaged in so many projects, we have a few listener questions for you about 
someone, some spirit that you've discussed earlier, your house spirit or a spirit in your house, uh, Hiram. And we have a few listener questions for you. And please you know, take as much time as you'd like from uh, Jorge Rivera. And Jorge is asking and saying, uh, greetings, Alex and Frater Chassan. My questions are not so much about further interactions with Goetic spirits, but Frater Chassan's interactions with his house spirit, the one in the skull. And Jorge has three questions for you, Frater, which are, is the spirit not the one who owned the skull in life? Do you treat Hiram like family, a friend or colleague or all of the above? And how or what do you feed it? What is its energy source? As a priest in Palo Meombe and Lukumi, Jorge says, I'm fascinated with how different schools of thought approach this. So in, anything you can you can share, Frater, about Hiram? Yeah, definitely. So the to the first question, no, it's uh, it's not the um the the skull is not uh and the spirit wasn't the original owner, I guess is one way to say that. Uh Hiram is a very ancient uh spirit that uh, has been around for quite a long time. And uh, the skull was was purchased um, legally, but uh, since the, the laws have changed, but it, it came from uh, South America and um, actually arrived uh, on the day of Halloween and um, was told to me, even though I don't have any way to confirm this, that it was procured ethically. But um, it was something that... Uh, was uh, I was always fascinated by and that I really wanted to achieve, but I would have no idea just how much uh, this uh, this experiment would uh, be impactful for me for not just my magical work, but my entire life. But um, I explained kind of the the process of of bringing Hiram into the skull uh, in my second book. So it's it's quite a bit to go over now, but it's something that was a collaborative effort with um, my scryer and myself and through talking with a few other magicians about how to do this exactly. And that uh, was probably one of the more complex magical workings and worthwhile uh, magical workings that I've, I've ever done. Um, as far as how the spirits um, considered uh, teacher, part of the family, mentor, friend, yes, uh, to all of the above, um, quite a funny uh, and uh interesting, unique experience with my family. At first, my wife thought I was out of my mind, didn't like the idea of a skull of a human being being, you know, in the house and I was really worried about, you know, what kind of spirit would be, you know, in the house and how that was going to work out through the words of Hiram and, and coming to my wife. Uh, my wife will easily say over and over again that uh, he is by far the favorite person <laughs> and and uh, probably a, um, a man that she appreciates more than anybody um, in her life that way, which is saying a lot. And, and you know, she gives some exception to me, but uh, I think she she puts Hiram a little bit over through since his his involvement in not just my life, but my family's life, the the life of of uh, my wife. His advice and his words um, have been so impactful so impactful that they've undoubtedly life changing. And so that she regards him as, as one of the most prominent and important aspects of our life. And if, you know, whether magical or practical, she will confer to him to, um, uh, you know, say what uh, he can about any topic because uh, not once has his advice or words led us wrong. They've always been hugely positive and impactful We've made life changes. We've we've changed houses simply due to his uh, recommendations and and his uh, words. Um, we've made great achievements professionally and and personally uh, through his working. So um, early on, he said that he would he would prove his worth uh, to me, and uh, he continues to do that. You know, almost nine years. Well, yeah, just about nine years later. Um, without a doubt. So, um, yeah, he's something that, um, as a practice, my wife and I go to the magical chamber and it's a place where there's an altar, a traditional altar, and we do prayers every evening, but we always talk to Hiram, um, before, um, we leave the chamber and it's pretty much every single night. And, um, although he's, you know, he, he's made it, um, clear that, uh, 
he's not just there to inspire us every night that he he likes specific questions and for us to do the work ourselves he's not there to just like run our lives for us that um you know that engagement and the things that he has to say to us especially when we have specific questions for him are just invaluable uh invaluable to the point of um it would be difficult not to have uh access to him around and um and for that for the whole family so the um our children they they know of Hiram they um it's I think it's something that maybe as they become older they may appreciate even more but we we try not to go overboard to him but they're very aware of of Hiram and um uh yeah it's just amazing to have access to spirit and be able to communicate with a spirit literally on a daily basis. And it's something that we've become accustomed to, but um, looking back, forgot that's something that's, we haven't had that. And that a lot of people don't, you know, have that as something that they have access to um, every day. Feeding. Uh, yes. Yeah. What do I feed um, Hiram? So this is something that I wrote about in uh, a book an anthology with other magicians called ritual offerings because one of my first or early questions to him was um because one of the the requirements for him to stay active and and close and communicative within the skull is that he requires food offerings and this is something that i didn't quite understand so i asked him i'm like why why would a spirit need food how does it how do you get food can you tell me about you know, how you and other spirits appreciate food offerings. And he says, yes. He says, obviously, we don't eat and digest the way that um, human beings do, but food offerings are um, important nourishment for spirits in this way. Um, and he had me, I had the food offerings in front, and he's like, can you kneel down? And I remember he was instructing me, can you smell the food? Yes, I can smell it. And he's like, what you're smelling is actually a process of, um, energetic um, decomposition of of the food. Um, the particles, some small particles of the food are, are coming up into the air and that process of it basically decaying is like there's an energy that is actually happening with that is, is the food decays and it goes through this change and it enters the air. And he says that actual process, the, the energy behind the food decomposing or going into the air is the actual energy that the spirit's can consume. And um, he's like different foods and different offerings actually have, uh, he, I don't think he used vibration, but vibration comes to mind, a different signature or something that appreciate that a spirit can either appreciate or, or not, not appreciate. And uh, that there's different likes and different adherence depending on uh, the energy. And for him, he says that it's a source of uh, familiarization, but something that he appreciates is like, um, uh, dates and, um, uh, different other kind of dried fruits and figs and, uh, some kind of breads with, with honey on it and everything, and then water. And these are the kind of offerings that he appreciates more. So that's what, uh, that's what I've given to him year after year and, uh, that it's there for a little bit, but eventually it loses its uh, potency. So, I refresh it and, um, you know, bury or scatter the, the previous offerings and, and get him new ones. Um, but he says this, this process of, um, basically what we can understand through smell, uh, of things getting into the air. And it's the same thing with incense. And he appreciates incense, um, as well is that, that energetic transference from something solid to, I guess you could say almost immaterial, even though it's, you know, it just gets smaller and smaller, that actual process is something that nourishes spirits and, and keeps him, it says it keeps him a link um, linked into the physical world better so that we can communicate better. He's like, cause I once actually was like, what happens if we are not able to, you know, forget the offerings or you weren't able to get an offering. So he's like, well, it'd still be around, but my connection to the spiritual world and, and the ease for which we communicate would, would not be as easy. It would take, a while to reestablish that and, and the offerings not only for enjoyment is to keep that those links between the i guess the unseen and, and the seen world more accessible um so it was very fascinating how he described it to me that is amazing and such a subtle point i i, I never thought about this before but just offerings in in terms of going from something more solid to more 
if we should say immaterial, 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 smaller, smaller, and just bridging that bridging that gap, if you will, between say the quote unquote solid material world and the world that Hiram operates in. Wow, that is fascinating. Very cool. Yeah, I love his his lectures and his teachings that way I've learned. <laughs> I've learned so much. I'm like, oh, that's so, yeah, I was equally fascinated. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, uh, Frater Chassan, uh, this is for the listeners out there. Uh, please check out the episode with Charity as well, because Charity uh, was one of the most, when, when you two first met, as you shared in the podcast, she was very skeptical, like, wait, what do you do? You're a magician. I don't know about this now. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Charity is, as you say, is leading the charge on chatting with Hiram and, you know, making sure, you know, supporting a lot of the rituals and her own magical work and all of that. So that's just so great to see too. Yeah. It was a, such a great, um, this kind of relationship and how things evolved. And, and, uh, it's funny cause we were just reminiscing about this the other night when, uh, she had stepped away from religion, spirituality. She had some bad experiences with it, not great aspects with her, her parents or other people that she knew. And, uh, you know, it was pretty much agnostic atheists are just very much um, opposed to spirituality and, and religion. So, um, you know, when we met each other, she says, she's, she's like, yeah, always when you told me about this stuff, she's like, yeah, it's, it's all BS, but he can do what he wants. And, and uh, you know, that's, that's fine. Just don't expect me to be, you know, a part of it and, and this kind of thing. And this is things that she was thinking uh, that she told me later, but um I'd say fortunately or unfortunately being around me or certain members of my family, I think even if people are not non-believers or, or have never had any kind of spiritual experience, they will eventually <laughs> while spending any uh, amount of time. So um, yeah, since then and everything, she's, did you banish? Did you take care of this? I'm starting to see things, shadows and stuff moving around. And um, you know, I don't think she thanks me too much for the more disturbing things that can happen. Um, you know, around if you're not used to it, but she's, she's much more aware of it and, and yeah, make sure that I confer with Hiram on, on uh, any very important matters and um, that uh, she's been very much getting into the tarot and divination and, and Hiram has been encouraging her to, um, to do her own practices, to be, you know, involved and to use her intuition and, and her abilities that have been evolving. She, he's been a good mentor for her that way as well. So it's it's awesome to see how things have have evolved. Oh, that is so cool. Uh, well, we will certainly again uh, keep our ear to the ground on on any updates with that because I know that yourself and Charity are both just so uh, deeply involved and 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 busy with so many projects. Um, Frater Chassan, we also have a, a listener question on a topic that you've you've shared about and written about um, a lot as well, which is a, a listener question from Christina Estenis, and Christina is asking and saying. Hi, Alex. If Frater Chassan would be so kind to share, I'm curious to hear about any specific spirit interactions he would elucidate on. I have not personally worked with the grimoires, and I'm intrigued by what actually happens during the workings. And I'm always curious to hear how others experience things. Does Frater Chassan feel the spirit in his energetic field? Does he hear words, see things? How does he process these interactions, and what does he take away from them personally, Christina is asking. And I know that you've covered a lot of this as well in Gateways Through Light and Shadow and and in your in your writings, but anything about during the ritual and what you experience? Yeah. So first of all, there's um there's several I've had uh many unique experiences. There's some similarities, there's some things across the board that um I can now register of like, oh yeah, the spirit's about to arrive or that uh they're coming in, but the uh, the interactions can be fairly diverse, and uh, I'll just share a, a few different examples. Uh, for instance, uh, drawing spirits into crystals. Um, you know, when uh, I'm evoking an angel to appear and everything, one of the biggest things is that uh, the the light around and it's I have candles there, but it's it's like a different source of light. Um, uh, envelops um, the altar space and where the crystal is, and it just it seems to shine, but I don't know exactly where the origin is from. And uh, there's a perception of feeling, and it's it's quite impossible to put into words, but it's like something is there. And uh, now even the particular angels, like uh, they have a, a feeling signature. Um, it's like I can tell 
we, I know which one I'm evoking, but there's a particular feel for uh, the angels, like with the one from Jupiter versus the one like uh, Raphael or or Michael. Um, they each have a feeling that's associated uh, with them that that I recognize as as being them, and this is even be- before that I before I see them or perceive them uh, visually, and that's that's been something that's um, I really appreciate because it's so genuine and it's like, yep, that's them, but I couldn't, it's about impossible to, to, to articulate. Um, and then I will see, I perceive something within this, the, the crystal a lot of time, the actual mechanism where um, a face or sometimes their entire figure uh, will appear and I can recognize that. And I kind of zero in on that, but as um, I do the introductory or the greeting uh, invocation uh, uh, or prayer, and then when I can finally hear them, uh, the communication a lot of times will will change. Whereas I I ask them a question, and uh, this is primarily with the angels, but some of the replies where I can actually see uh, an image within the crystal that um, they'll their image will kind of fade out, and I'll be seeing a scenario, or sometimes. Um, my vision, I'm not looking at anything at all. I'm actually seeing the vision that they're presenting as part of their communication. And I can still hear them, but I lose um, awareness. And it's like I, I'm still there, but I'm no longer interested uh, or I'm not concerned, I, I should say, with having to look at the actual crystal ball or the mechanism itself. And, and I'm engaged with what they're showing me. And um, I can, I've been in, completely immersed in and vision of what of what they're showing me, and um, this happened even early on with the Almadel angel, where I was looking at this face within a crystal uh, and such, and it was amazing. But then I asked about um, you know what an earlier version of the Almadel looked like, and I forgot the Almadel wasn't there anymore. That the I was enwrapped in a in a vision, and I was seeing a person kneeling on a floor in this little metallic altar looking thing, and I could see things quite clearly. Um, and so that uh, the communication can kind of get um, overwhelming, and that's why I think working with a scryer is uh, very beneficial. Because especially working with the angels, I can hear them, um, I can see them, but sometimes I'm shown these, you know, immersive visions, and I'm not really concerned with where I'm at, which is the, the circle and. You know, and all these apparatuses that are there, it's they they kind of take a, a background um, appreciation, and uh, it's just all I can say is that it's very immersive. But um, in other circumstances, uh, like with some of the goetic operations, I don't. I have the triangle outside of the circle, and um, I've gotten to practice where I use a, a black, uh, well, it's a bed sheet basically, it's a drop cloth, and I use it against the wall simply to um, not have anything in the background that's disturbing a vision because often sometimes when I'm when I'm evoking uh, the outside of the circle, the magical circle, the area becomes uh, distorted um, and space becomes distorted. whereas um, I'm used to not only seeing but perceiving wall space in a certain place, but it, I, I swear almost audibly and, and visually, the uh, the space outside this circle distorts. Without it, sounds like my voice is projecting beyond the boundaries of the physical wall, which don't really make sense to me. And that I'm perceiving something that uh, that the walls aren't there anymore. That the space is is gone, or it just looks it's different. And the spirit will come from that space and start to materialize. And at first, it seems. Uh, they've appeared in, in some different ways. There's incense smoke, yes, and it's not like they come, they form the body out of the smoke, but it's like uh, the the nebulous space that where the wall used to be is that they start coming into view, and they start coming uh, sometimes gradually, sometimes uh, more taking shape, and they fill up a space that doesn't quite make sense with the space physically that was there, and that's the best way that I can explain it and then i'm communicating with them but um their voice and my voice sounds like it's coming across um in a different environment beyond the circle and uh i know that may sound ambiguous in some way it's just again it's hard to explain 
but that they'll fill and they'll be much bigger than um, I thought they could fit um, in a space. And uh, their appearance um, can kind of take over, uh, I guess, the, the appreciation of the whole the whole art. I'm aware of my circle. I'm aware of of even glancing down sometimes on questions, but their their form is just kind of um, captivating because it's so strange. It's so unusual uh, how they appear that um, it just it seems to really have my attention beyond anything else. Um, so yeah, and then um, sometimes even before they ar- arrive, there's light distortions. There's like little flickerings um, that I try not to pay too much attention to. Um, I'll see them out of the peripheral of my eye, or a lot of uh, shadows or uh, mists that seem to like zoom from one area to the other, and that usually tells me that oh, something is occurring or they're about to um, arrive. But again, I don't want to try to fixate on them because um, when I have before, it seems like it kind of messed up the process of of them trying to arrive um so there maybe there is kind of a uh, a gaze or a sense of attention that that comes with evocation especially with working with uh goetic beings especially when they're materializing before you um there's a sense of i don't know there's a weird perception changes and um i i find that very interesting uh when i'm doing those arts so uh, similar things, but very unique uh, perceptions too, and sometimes smells, uh, different smells. Um, it can there's uh, one, a couple spirits in particular that have very distinct scents. Uh, one of the goetic beings um, is I I know when I work with them every single time because for whatever reason the smell that accompanies their arrival and that is there the whole time that they're there is. The same smell of when you're touring ancient castles and they have tapestries and, and ancient, you know, old bed sheets and they smell like ancient tapestries in a castle. And it smells and feels like you're in an ancient castle. I don't know why, but that's just what uh, that uh, is a signature about them where I know I'm dealing with that spirit. So, um, yeah, all kinds of things, but um, kind of distortions that accompany their their arrival. That's such a fascinating point. And especially also not getting distracted. I mean, sometimes someone might be, especially if it's their first time uh, engaging in an evocatory procedure, let's say, and they see beads of light outside the circle and they go, stop everything. I'm going to focus on the beads of light and and I'm going to, I'm going to look right there. And where was I with this conjuration? Ah, Don't worry about it. We got beads of light. And, and so it it sounds like there's this gentle reminder that, that you have, especially early on Frater Chassan, where you kind of guide your attention back to, okay, I acknowledge that there's something, but I'm not going to let that interfere with the direct application of following through with the ritual, following through the conjuration. Would that be somewhat fair? Yeah, I think there's that's definitely part of it. Is um, there's a lot of things, especially if if uh, when you're not used to seeing phenomenon, it's a way to um, I, I, yeah, you can become dis- distracted or almost forget what you're what you're doing. And I think that's another practice point of when, especially if you've done it a few times and nothing's happened, and then something starts to happen, it's easy to get um, excited. But there is a um, a process to it and kind of a Again, going back to the patience and the open openness, that empty cup of of waiting for things to evolve um, as it's meant to, maybe on the spirits end, and allowing yourself to to, to maintain presence within the present of that experience, so letting it um, evolve as it does, and not um, trying to grasp on anything, but following the natural progression of of the evocation. That way, I think is. Um, is definitely a learned skill is something that um, you have to do through experience for sure. Well, Frater Chassan, speaking of experience and earlier we were chatting about Materia Magica and just all of the work that you put into that. We have a listener question for you from uh, Alex Brock Art and Alex Brock Art is saying, thank you so much for sharing your experiences. I've read both gateway books and I've gone back through the evocations and light and shadow countless times. The wisdom and compassion in the encounters has deeply impacted me and it's changed my life. Alex says, I'm an artist and I'm curious about integrating magic with paintings and sculptures. 
I'm vaguely familiar with image magic from the Picatrix, but the creation of those images seems different than pouring your creative energy into a personal expression of something. There's two aspects of an artwork, for example, the actual subject matter of the piece and what that conveys directly. And then there are things like consecrating it or making it with corresponding materia magica or certain astrological elections, etc. So Alex is asking, Frater Chasan, with your experience making talismans, how could one make an artwork potently or specifically magical? That's a great question. Great question. So I can look at this in in uh, a few different ways, and and uh, the ways how um, my talismans have have worked for uh, clients, and the ways that I make them. Um, I think I appreciated them in a, in a ways of actually um, going back to some previous. I say case studies or just uh, some stories that I came upon where uh, some objects have either been possessed or haunted in a way. And uh, speaking about paintings, there's there's some um, classical cases of, of uh, particular paintings being very haunted or or having spirit attachments to them. Um, and so in some fashion, I see talismans, effectual talismans of as having um, basically a controlled haunting or attachment of part of the spirit. I see the the spirit imbues part of their their essence, part of their office, but it's intended to, f- to function a very particular way that's obviously meant to be positive for the the owner or the wearer of the talisman. But um, in other ways, I guess to, I would say it's a similar um, process that other spirits have been able to possess or create an attachment to objects um, and have, you know, basically consequential things happen if, if certain people would get a hold of them. Uh, my father is a great example of that. Um, so if something even had, I think, a remote attachment, um, if he became in possession of it, it would wake up and it would cause all manner of disturbances within his house, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't be aware that um, he would just, he's like, Brian is like, if things been fine. How come I'm having these bad hauntings? And, um, you know, I go over to house and I'm like, dad, what's this by the, the fireplace? Oh, isn't that great? That's, I think that's like an 18th century wooden cradle, but I use it to, to put firewood in and you know, this kind of thing. I'm like, no, dad, you can't, you know, this kind of thing. I'm, I'm getting off a little bit of attachment or on a tangent, but um, uh, magicians, especially, or certain people, I noticed that they can wake up uh, certain things that um, may have an attachment. It may be more latent, but uh, there's, there's certain circumstances that um, objects can can very much. Um, I keep on wanting to say wake up or whatever whatever they're attached with can uh, have an effect on the area or the people that come in contact with them. Thus, talismans and getting back to to paintings. So um, uh, a magician can do this in a very intentional way, where they can make something or make a piece of art at a specific time. And they can use specific mediums. Oh, and especially if we're talking about magic, talk about uh, consecrating your paints, your paintbrush. And especially if all those things are geared towards that specific purpose, then you're very much doing a magical act and able to put your creative um, inspiration in with that. So um, I guess the easiest way to talk about this would be an example. So uh, if you can mix together your own pigments and maybe add some mediums and stuff, maybe, uh, I don't know, crushed yangling and, um, or a little bit of that oil yangling and, and maybe some crushed, um, emerald, you know, very fine powder, mix it in with your, your green paint, uh, a little bit, and then put it on a canvas and everything that was specifically prepared and, and begin your working on a favorable day and hour Venus, um, on a Friday while playing some music. I mean, put as much correspondence as you can um, into this. And then, you know, maybe painting a, you know, beautiful lady in the screen, um, you know, dress and holding the comb, um, doing some classical imagery from like the Picatrix uh, in this uh, instance. And then, um, you know, when you're done fuming it with with um, incense of, of Venus, but also um, doing an evocatory process like from the Key of Solomon where you're asking Venetian spirits or uh, a Venus-related entity to come and to either inhabit the painting directly um, or to consecrate it. It's going to be depending on how you word it. 
um, I don't want to give people too many ideas, but there's a way that you could bind a spirit to uh, an object, but uh, that can have consequences as well, depending on what you're trying to achieve. So there's favorable ways and more forceful ways to do that. But uh, that would be a way to make a very powerful image magic so that um, wherever that painting was, somebody who was looking at it, somebody that came in contact with it, the house or building that it resided in, um, it's going to affect that area for sure. It's going to um, impact people who come in contact with it. Um, so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's lovely, Frater Chassan. And, and there you go, Alex. That's that theme again, you know, building from the ground up and, and every step of the way. I just love that imagery, by the way, of finely powdered emerald. That's it's going to stay in my mind for a while. It's just lovely. Um, and Frater Chassan, too, it, speaking of taking things step by step, being intentional and and someone who you've uh, been on the podcast with before, Ben McStefan, your amazing scryer. Uh, we have a listener question for you again from Alex Brockart, who is saying, it seems some people, Frater Chassan, come into this world wired to be able to see spirits and see things naturally. Do you have any insight into why some can and some cannot? Is there sometimes a good reason someone is, quote unquote, astrally blind? I've heard of this changing through things like a near-death experience or a dramatic spiritual event where it's like the floodgates open. Is there a way to train this like a skill, like how you've mentioned practicing scrying or to get help from spirits with this? That's a great question. Yeah. So it harkens back to, to the prior discussion. And uh, one could say that one is quote, uh, born so forth from his mother's womb as a magician and I do think there is something into this, um, again, going back to traditions and across cultures, across times and languages, uh, there does seem to be that people or who um, are able to perceive spirits that uh, it is something that is, is, is passed down to them genetically somehow, uh, that you're going to find aspects through relatives and you know grandparents and ancestors that, um, that this is kind of a calling. Uh, but that is not every single time. And uh, then just like uh, they mentioned, um, yeah, having a near-death experience, um, again, going back to that journey, you're immersed or very, very close put into the underworld, uh, very close to the spirit world at some point while alive. And, and coming out of that experience has given you access to the, the spirit world to now perceive, to see, hear, or get perceptions of, of spirits that way. Uh, those two aspects, I think, are, are the biggest ones to, to show somebody that's really been called to be, I say a magician, but whatever word they want to use for having interactions with the this, this spirit world. Um, within the magical community, there is, um, I think, some frustration because not everybody is. I think uh, people have potentialities, but there are definitely people that are called to this and, and able to perceive things and people who are not. And um, I think that is intentional, uh, very much intentional for the destiny or the uh, the story, the the life the person is living, uh, because it, it does make things more difficult and more complex and uh, makes a whole other aspect to life that... Um, you know, creates an aspect of, of things to balance and things to work through. And human beings, we we usually have enough on our plate already without adding to the mix of of uh, something else that is almost intangible. So it um, it definitely makes life more complex. It can enrich life, but um, just like people are born to different traits and skill sets and things that can develop more naturally. Um, yeah, I think people people are called. Um, like other skills, um, like art and other things you can develop through practice. Uh, I definitely did through uh, scrying practice and such um, activities that I relate in my book. And it is definitely something that can be developed. Um, for some people, though, if, you know, if they just don't have the, the capacity, it can be frustrating because no matter how hard they try, it's just not, they don't have the, uh, I guess the the language inside of their head for for things like that to be able to perceive and and that's just something they have to come to grips with. But uh with saying that um 
the third, I guess, third option would be an undertaking of basically immersing yourself into the underworld consciously on purpose. And uh, there's a little bit of debate about this, but the the Abramelin operation, uh, Spirit Quest, and I believe is quite honestly the on purpose descending into the underworld with hopes of reemerging with connecting to the spiritual world in a very systematic way. Uh, it is the shedding of consciousness and ego and attachment and basically an undoing of yourself. And it's something that cannot be done comfortably or in control, uh, in control in this space of you can't do it comfortably, you know, just within your house and, you know, with your computer and your day-to-day things that you're attached to and undergo this process. I think it uh, it has to be undergone, if not through the process of Abramelin as it's written, then uh, in a space that um, forces one to break with their conscious attachments and paradigms that they have established for themselves in prospect of, of um, how they view themselves, how they view others, and how they view reality. Frater Chassan, this leads actually to the last question we had for you from Alex Brock Art. And Alex Brock is asking to this exact point, how does this ability, Frater Chassan, to see spirits tie in with the holy guardian angel? Does one need some faculty in this ability to successfully reach knowledge and conversation with their HGA? Or do you have any advice for practicing something like Abramelin in the modern day? Thank you for all that you do. It's deeply moving and inspiring. My oh, great. This is a great question. And also thank you to that listener. <clears throat> so, yes, I think there's a lot of uh, mystery to the, the process of the Holy Guardian Angel and some things that I don't think that are quite touched on. And uh, it really does come down to the breaking down of the the ego and uh, allowing for a different space and a different person to emerge. Um, I do feel personally this is the the actual Abermelon process and uh, the seeking to unite with one's um, divine genius or holy guardian angel uh, really has to be done in a way that um, allows there to be space and allow for a new union to actually emerge. And this is something that can't be done comfortably or artificially or even intellectually. I don't think this is a process that could ever be done simply, uh, you know, that way through just kind of an academic or or, um, process through, you know, mental exercises and such. Um, It really does require that kind of um, submerge, uh, submersion into the, um, the underworld, being able to enter into the underworld and, and shedding and undoing of the self of the consciousness and, uh, the perceptions that we've built up and, uh, created since, since birth basically. And, um, realizing that our personality our perceptions for ourselves, for the world and for others is something that can be, um, let go of and actually redone. Uh, while still being alive, but this isn't a gentle process or something that is is easy. Uh, but as far as seeing spirits and um, the way that the HGA connects to working magic in general, I think this is what it speaks to, is that <clears throat> when we let go of a lot of things and a lot of perceptions about how things work, uh, we have the potential potentiality of um, learning a brand new way to to see and to perceive and to work uh, within the world. And uh, the only way that I know of uh, that this can be done is to really break things down to their central parts and uh, to have them rebuilt, uh, hopefully in a much more enlightened or constructive or just a new way. And uh, different ways besides the book of Abermelon that... Uh, does this is uh, I think um, the Native American, what used to be called vision quest or vision journey uh, is a way to do that where you're going out into the wilderness. And this kind of harkens back to the, my own Abermelon process, but uh, you're moving yourself out and away from society and from distractions. Um, I mean, talk about fasting in both uh, social media and actual food and, and such, um, your brain will definitely rewire with enough time spent out in isolation, uh, just being in nature. And uh, there comes to a point where 
when you don't have other people around or other things that um, reflect back to you the the created reality that uh, you've essentially made and others have made for you, um, <clears throat> something new can really start to emerge. Something where nature and uh, basically a higher or different um, sets of principles can be implemented uh, through your surroundings and uh, it can be extremely powerful. It can also be extremely devastating to um, come face to face with the, the things that we've built up as truths about ourselves and about the world. And uh, it can be hard to have those broken down and uh, to see the world in a completely different light. But uh, to me, that is the process of uniting truly with your HGAs when you've got a space and a vessel and that you can reconnect to something that you can't perceive of uh, intellectually. You can't even really imagine it. It's not something that dwells in the imagination. It's something that extends and is integrated far beyond uh, what those mental concepts mean. And uh, so... Any kind of experience, maybe not any kind, but the the experiences that really take you to your limits of separating yourself from your surroundings, from your habits, from the created constructs of reality and social engagements, um, really forcing you to to spend time, you know, with yourself and just with nature. Uh, with something that possibly can't be seen or perceived at that time, those are going to be the things that that are going to lead to reality and uh, connecting to what um, the concept, the true concept of the HGA is, but not the perceived and imagined one uh, that uh, you may have established before. So that's kind of the uh, the best advice I can give on that. That's incredibly powerful. And again, for for those who think of the HGA as this as you say, this very powerful, but this very, oh, it's a very celestial kind of, it's a very deeply chthonic rooting grounding thing as well. And I just think that's, that's so wonderful, Frater Chassan. Um, we also, Frater Chassan, speaking of kind of these very important big picture um, approaches to things, we also have a listener question for you from Damien Gordon. And Damien is asking and saying, has Frater Chassan read John King's recent live journal posts? His ideas are original and well thought out. And I know that Brian respects him. My sense is Brian might have a different perspective on these things, but basically, and I'm summarizing, Damien, your, your question here, uh, the purpose of the magical ceremonies in this perspective is not so much to get the spirits to do things for you, but to bind them to remove their influence so that the operator's will can be enacted. So the question that Damien has is, what do you think, Frater Chassan, of this position, and how does it differ with your own position? What is the nature and purpose of these spirits and the relationship with humanity? Are they tempting and deceiving humans? Yeah, it's a big discussion. And, and I do have tremendous respect for uh, for John King. And I think he touches on a points uh, with the spirits that, um, that does have a lot of credibility. And there's some uh, within the Goetia that um, I have not contacted personally, but I could see how uh, dealing with them could be potentially very harmful and, and dangerous uh, with people, especially if they think they, that any of these spirits, honestly, are just genie to call up and to get what you want in life. I think that would be very naive uh, to assume that um, because they don't work that way. Uh, on the same point, I don't think these beings are necessarily um, in their own right um, in in their purpose to be evil in the sense of them fulfilling roles of deceiving and harming people either individually or collectively purposefully, at least not the majority or the ones that I've spoken to that, that doesn't um, come across. They have their own nature that may or may not be in line with the will and um, appreciations of the people that are calling them quite simply. They, they have their own working and they seem oddly invested in uh, humanity and the workings of humans. And I say oddly because they seem to be involved in various aspects where they have their own agenda and they have their own workings. And this is where I can see where, where John would come to some, some of these conclusions about them for sure, because they seem to, to um, 
manipulate or at least like to to lead certain things um uh in respects of of how people are uh conducting things on on rather large scales typically um on that same note they seem oddly um interested and preoccupied when um i'm asking them about things about how we we treat one another and then how we're using some of this information and and for some odd reason for if evil spirits they don't like the idea of their offices their abil- abilities being used to get the one up on other people necessarily or to take advantage of people or circumstances in in an otherwise like a unethical way at least the ones that i've spoken to have kind of made that clear and i find that kind of confusing from uh some of the standpoints that uh, you know we understand these these demons um so i think that requires some deeper investigation on on my point uh or for me personally but uh what I have discovered is that they, many of them really do seem to represent themselves as uh, deities or beings that were involved in particular aspects or periods of, of human evolution, development, uh, and various cultures and circumstances that they were looked to, they were they were prayed to, they were involved in, in, in a lot of their um I guess their whole being is is kind of wrapped up in in to what these situations mean. Like, for instance, there's a a being that um, a client uh, uh, had me evoke, and it was pre uh, its its office was to get men and women together to relationships and to form love and this kind of thing. And um, upon uh, evoking, it found out that it's not really uh, acknowledged now. There's not really a, a name. It says that's left over, but it's uh, appeared quite differently than it was explained in, in the uh, the grimoire, but uh, as this very fancy but very Middle Eastern dressed um, man that its, um, its image, it said, related to a profession that um, was basically uh, given to, to certain pe- beings in this culture that would be the intermediary between people to be married, that it was highly ritualized and that men and women, you know, they didn't really talk to each other. Well, they were, they weren't men and women. They were kind of like children, but their families controlled them greatly. And they didn't have much social, if any interaction at all. So their whole purpose was to, to talk between them, to tell wonderful things about the boy and wonderful things about the girl and, and back and forth. And that this was a position that was that really moved the entire culture. It made families come together or go apart. It uh, basically structured how the whole culture would would move and to grow and to evolve. And so this being was like in charge of that. And so understood how to communicate between uh, males and females. And that it said its role had changed dramatically from those days because it basically didn't exist uh, for the most part. He said in very small parts, it was still very active, but um, the that the culture parts they were, they were small, and that um, <clears throat> you know its whole involvement was the correct way to to speak between men and women to create you know love and basically establish families that would in turn establish you know uh, communities and then you know would kind of ripple into um, various cultures and that it had its own way. I guess its own appreciation and it can manipulate, I mean, it manipulated uh, certain communities very uh, successfully and, and widespread for a while. And now it was pretty much involved in, in certain relationships, but only particularly. And I could see where as a human being, um, we could either appreciate or not the way that it was doing that. I mean, it was moving in a way that we didn't want to go, or it was kind of keeping us apart, or maybe we wanted relationships, but um you know, we weren't having any, and maybe that we could blame part of that on the spirit. I don't know. There's a lot of ways to look at that, but that by communicating with it and maybe binding it to assist us, uh, it could bring about more of what we want and maybe less of what we didn't want. Um, So it's very complex, but as far as it just being evil and working against people, I'd say that'd be too simplistic. There might be a part of its office that 
for whatever reason is working against what we want and and our happiness in some regard but um i almost see that as a uh i don't know like an astrological equation just because we weren't born with with certain things in our charts that would make relationships easy as they are for other people and everything but the spirit could assist um so different aspects like like that very difficult to explain but uh they I think either calling them good or evil and everything just as um, I haven't been able to do that um, with them, but communicating with them respectfully, I, I ask, you know, how do you work in the world? What's your involvement with people? Just like I do with the angels. And uh, the responses are always very interesting, but never to the point of, you know, I'm here to cause problems for people or I'm here to, um, you know, to make their life miserable. There are some that says, you know, I do teach people and certain people that go after this, you know, I make them see life in a certain way. So yes, if you're on that receiving end of their lessons or the harsher part of their office, um, yeah, they would, they would appear evil and everything because they're, they're not working in your best interest. And um, I think that's one way to, per, to perceive them. Uh, very, very interesting, but they, they seem um, very much in their roles. They acknowledge uh, divinity, but it's after working so much, the uh, there's such a different perception of good versus evil and this war in heaven and, you know, the demons trying to fight against God. I'm just, none of that is perceiving. They even talk about someone sometimes themselves being fallen and, you know, they don't being fallen angels or, or, but it's almost like they're just fulfilling their part in, in creation in their universe. And there's not really any uh, attachment. There's definitely no anger or um, resentment uh, for the creator, at least not, not what I've come across. There might be other spirits where I just haven't um, witnessed that yet, but so far it's been, um, every single time different than I would have imagined and going back to the, the imagination and, and perceptions. Um, but to, to go back to John King's point, I, I still think there's relevance there that um, cause we've spoken even personally several times that sometimes with these beings, there is a binding that you do to inhibit the negative aspects or the aspects that are making your life difficult uh, or your own workings in life where there's blockades, binding that and removing that. And then if you choose, you know, harnessing the the positive or at least constructive aspects of, of them and working with them that way, it's a different understanding. It's not, I'm not just saying wish for the things that are promised or that um, the book says that you can get from them. It's, it's a big difference in calling them up and saying, give me this. Um a lot of times that can cause problems because we're asking the wrong questions. We're looking at the situation incorrectly. We're perceiving the spirit incorrectly. And I think this is where a lot of potential harm is. So dealing with them as um, aspects and involvements in, in creation and understanding how they work in the world at large. And then if so, how are they working or influencing your life in particular. And then understanding that in the correct way, I think can help formulate the correct ways that you can work with them and either, you know, bind or restrict certain things or remove from your, your life if you're able to, and then, um, you know, potentially ask for things that you would like their involvement. If, if so, sometimes it just might not be something that you care to have in your life, which is perfectly understandable. But um, so far, that's my my understanding. But I do know that there are harmful spirits out there that they're not interested in helping human beings on any level, and they're not beneficial to work with. It's against their nature, as it would be for us. But as far as these beings listening to 72, so far, the ones that I've spoken to, are they're, they're complex. They uh, come from cultures and situations and stuff that modern people really wouldn't get a full grasp on and I don't either. And I, I, I have to appreciate that my understanding is limited that way and that I'm very careful and diplomatic about how I deal with them. I try to be respectful, 
Um, I don't go buddy, buddy, but I, I also don't treat, treat them harshly as if they're my enemy. Cause I don't think that's very helpful at all. So it's, it's something very much in between there. I really appreciate that Frater Chasan. And I really hope the listeners do too, because it's just such as, as you always touch on such a deeply intentional, very big picture, very respectful, fully sincere way over long periods of time to engage with the spirits. And so I, I certainly appreciate that. And, and I also echo your, your um, thoughts, you know, John King, I definitely recommend his Imperial Arts Live Journal, just really, really great posts as well. And Frater too, in terms of this big picture thinking, uh, we have another listener question for you from Damian Gordon, who is saying and sharing much of the lore of spirits, both in spirit lists and surrounding mythology, such as the book of Enoch, describes spirits as teachers, which bring knowledge, including physical knowledge of the world, teaching the properties of plants, metallurgy, and other things. Similarly, certain spirits are said to have the ability to tell the future or past. It certainly seems that spirits can deliver on these promises. For example, David Rankin on a recent episode, uh, as example of being warned not to go on the tube uh, the day of the London bombings or John King's golden cavern, or indeed the many examples laid out in Brian's own books. At the same time, however, what they can deliver seems to be strictly limited. For instance, I've never seen any really precise predictions from spirit contact about important future world events that turned out true. The impressive ones, like David Rankin's uh, tube experience, are parochial to David's life, not something that could forewarn others of the attack. Historical magicians labored under many misunderstandings about the physical world, which the spirits never seem to correct them on such as the real nature of celestial bodies that they were so fascinated by or the nature of various illnesses. It took regular science to learn these things. So I'm curious, Damien says, as one of the foremost practitioners, Frater Chasan, when it comes to things like revealing knowledge about the world, the past, and the future, what can and can't the spirits do? Should we ever take a spirit's broad predictions about the fate of humanity a hundred years from now seriously, or their statements about history? If they're not able to teach us the theories and equations to unify quantum theory and general relativity, for example, when pushing things to the limit, what sorts of knowledge about the world can these spirits teach? <laughs> Was put in such a great way, such <laughs> very well done, and uh, definitely the same. Um, obviously, didn't put it in the exact same way, but the the same questions that um, I myself was getting into this is and uh, what I attempted to record in in the books, and you know what kind of knowledge, how useful is it, how much can we really rely on it as you know data that can be tested against and and really you know proven to be true, useful, so on and so forth. So very much involved in, in the same uh, curiosities that way uh, in my working. And um, the same results that, that I find even for you know myself, there's there's been some big life events uh, for myself. Um, you know, going back to the example before, I mean, hiring my house spirit, you know, telling me like, you know, you want to sell your house now, you want to do this now because something's better, you're going to be able to get, you know, a place that's you know, much bigger and you're going to have the space for your magical you know, room and everything that you envision, so on and so forth. And it was a lot to go on on faith because from every, my perceptions, like I, we don't have the money to do this right now. It doesn't seem like a good time to sell one. And it turned out he was completely true, even, even more than I would have imagined, but there were still even hurdles in the way that, you know, weren't exactly um, told to me even by Hiram about, I thought it, I was convinced we were going to be in this, this one house that we found and, we tried and tried and it didn't work. It ended up being another house that was far later. And it wasn't like everything went totally easily. It was exactly as you said, but you know, not every step of the way. And again, I think this comes across as how information is appreciated for people and for humans and how it's appreciated and disseminated by spirits. Uh, very different. And I think this, this goes to a lot of the frustration, especially for modern people and and testing the uh, the usefulness and uh, the directness of of these kinds of exchanges, because um, it is the same thing, especially with angels and in, in asking them about things and the future events. Um, a lot of it is done very uh, allegorically or sometimes cryptically, sometimes very beautifully poetically. But 
uh, always uh, leaving something uh, for the human being. And going back to Hiram, I go, other clients are curious because he had me ask about this. And I'm curious too, why don't we get this? He's like, simple. If you were giving the straight you know, data and everything all the time, it would disrupt the, the whole basically story mechanism about human beings working through the world. So there's a, um, according to him and other things I'm learning, there's a measuring process, even with powerful magicians, that the information we get, the type of information and the timing is, even if they're bound and even if, you know, we're a powerful magician, uh, we're going to be allotted certain things in a certain way. Um, that's not going to take the fun out of life and, and being an active participant. Um, not only that, but it goes back to various equations about how things move, especially for future events. Um, there's We could look at astrology and such. We can look at a lot of things, but there's, there's patterns. There's definite patterns. And the more that we train as magicians and we're aware of things, we see the patterns. Uh, we see the correspondences. But it's not always a one-for-one one direct same outcome thing every time. It's because the variables and the movements between are highly complex. And uh, it is a story, but for me, I kind of look at it as um, for as genius as, as some of us are, and I'm not talking about myself by any means, but other people who can really see uh, big pictures, both um, academic. Uh, mathematically, philosophically, and so on, um, they start to connect a lot of the dots, but nobody can see all the dots. Um, I always see it as kind of like a huge sphere with points on a grid and then various points in the sphere moving at the same time, like a huge puzzle, uh, Rubik's cube, but in circular form, and then different things, you know, clicking or corresponding at different times, but nobody has it all figured out. Maybe this is only a, a God thing that can see the whole pattern the whole equation that way but without getting too philosophical um, the the spirits are connected to these but even they are connected in very particular ways they may have a broader perspective than we as as human beings and in, in our current states do and they can see much more of um the tree the tapestry the <laughs> equation whatever you want to call it the matrix they're able to perceive it in a, a broader and a different perspective and they can give us part of that, but even they can't give us the complete uh, working of, of the equation for, for certain things. So yeah, we ask about what's humanity going to be like in a in hundred years um, because they can see the future. The book says so. Um, I believe that they can, they can see aspects and they can give us this aspect to the, the fullest ability that one, they they have themselves and maybe two, what they're allotted to tell us. Um, what they're they're able and and allowed to reveal to us within whatever restrictions that they're a part of. And um, with us having that knowledge that goes back because once we have certain knowledge of certain things, that changes the whole story because we can make different actions. <laughs> and it gets very complex about how things work and the whole butterfly effect of of what what does that change for us? What are we going to change? And magic is about change and manipulation and what are we going to be allowed to manipulate because we know certain things. So, yeah, with all my exper experiences and when I deal with clients that want to know certain things, that uh, that ask for certain things, I, I tell them that, you know, I'll ask them, um, but I'm not going to force them to, you know, try to reveal certain things if they're not giving it readily. I might try to you know, press it a, a different way or present the question a different way. But, um, and also what you get might not be what you're expecting or what, um, what's going to be immediately useful. The conversations and exchange are, are still a mystery on, on many levels. And even though I think I've, I've learned incredible things, I've been able to make changes, not only for myself, but for people who have come to me um, asking certain questions and, things to ponder, to ponder. Um, for whatever reason, um, it's still presented in a way that does not take full mystery out of life and, and some of the bigger questions. It's, it doesn't give it all up. And I think it's very much intentionally done that way. And I've, I've learned to be patient in some respects and, and also not 
um, entirely reliable or um, relying upon, you know, what the angel or what the spirit is going to present as um, dictating the course of my entire existence. It's changed so much of my existence and and how I perceive the world and how I enact in the world, but um, it hasn't removed the perceptions of choice and discovery and curiosity, which again, going back, I think is intentional. I don't know if that's useful for the listeners and um, it may seem like a, a cop-out, but it's, um, it's one of the things that it hasn't, it hasn't deterred me to continue to converse, uh, to learn and to ask things of the spirits because it's been insanely useful, but it has removed some fantasies of, you know, getting the lottery numbers the first time I ask, or, you know, um, knowing certain predictions that um, I can change the course, not only of my life, but of so many people's lives um, that I would do so on a, on a whim, just because now I have the knowledge and potential. I think those things are governed and, uh, and kept in a particular way. I love that, Frater Chassan, to your point and to Hiram's point about this participatory aspect of engaging in reality and that it's a story and it's unfolding and it's not permanent and it's not set in stone. So Frater Chassan, with all of this going on, you are so busy. You are a martial artist. You're teaching classes. You have clients You for magical work. You have your personal magical work. You are a husband, you are a father, you have so much going on. And so I think as we wrap up the podcast here, Frater Chasan, can you tell us a little bit about your upcoming projects, where people can find you? And I think this is best uh, said in a listener question from Krishna Koloko. And Krishna is saying, hey, Alex and Frater Chasan, my question is if Frater Chasan can share with us an update about his work with the Goetic Spirits, interactions, manifestations, results, and if he is planning to write a book about it. So anything and everything that you can share, Frater Chassam, would be awesome. Sure. So, yeah, touching on that point first, um, and I've been asked a couple of times if, if I'm going to put out a book about Goetia too. And um, for the longest time, I didn't think I, I would because so many authors have, have already done that from several directions. And, and John King, I think, has done an, an excellent job as well of presenting that. So what I have personally is um, a collection of of workings and uh, the results from them, both uh, for my personal uh, evocations and then several ones from clients. And um, I've got quite, um, quite a collection now of, of individual workings and uh, there's a possibility I might do a publication, um, but it would be uh, some highly edited because I would have to take the personal questions and, and workings from the client out and basically keep my own inquiries that, that I've made uh, to the spirits and my own discoveries that uh, are unrelated. Um, so how that would look and what that would look like, um, I guess it would be you know, possibly in, in interest to, to some readers. But um, also, I would like to continue the, with the work. And uh, if I do um, plan on on having something published, it would be to present the Goetia or present these spirits and kind of the way of working that um, was not redundant and uh, really provided with the the readers with something that could be you know more usable you know for their own works and uh, you know for the the magical community. And uh, in some ways, I think I've I've touched on some of this with my my personal discoveries and the spirits and their identities and how they've appeared to me and the kind of workings they've they've done in in uh, in my life and for the you know for some of the life and clients if I can you know present examples without revealing identities or personal things about their requests um, I see it as kind of my another working catalog kind of like gateways through light and shadow. Um, where it's it's just been a lot of personal work and discoveries and and um, what uh, what this art has has meant to me personally. So I guess the, the short answer would be possibly it's just still um, putting it together in a usable and readable format that would be interesting and, and useful um, to readers. And uh, that's still got some work. Um, other projects I have on the board are are similar, like uh, the Thurgio Goetia. 
and uh, other arts that um, I've been working uh, working from and to present my findings and and how things have, have appeared to me and the tools that I've made and, and such. Uh, still working on on Hiram's book, which I think my wife has been pressing upon me over and over again because um, it is quite fascinating. It's um, it basically involves sessions of sitting down with him and and asking him, you know, okay, he's this you know figure that we know vaguely about from you know biblical and other sources, and uh, so what what is the journey of this being in the spirit that? came from here and moving up all up to the point of working with me in, in a skull. And it's been an amazing story. Um, almost unbelievable, but fascinating in some respects. And, and is really writing just like a, a very fantastical, but, um, but very inspirational journey of, of this being and, and, um, and Hiram's, uh, um, I guess, uh, yeah, his personal story and then how he's worked with me and and some of the things that he has to say about topics, um, both personal and, and general, and putting that together in, in a readable uh, format. And, um, and uh, it really just comes down to me putting so many things aside and, and working selectively on that and, and hopefully getting back uh, back to that, because I think it would be something that people would love to read. And, and I just find it personally, if nothing else, even if they didn't, I'd like to have it for me and for maybe my family is <laughs> kind of a, a very, um, you know, fantastic journey of that spirit. That's become my, my house spirit. Um, but people can find me online. Facebook is, is usually the, the primary platform still just because so many, um, people know of my work and, and are connected to me there. And, um, clients that ask for talismans or magical implements or um, all of my classes, my four online magical classes that I have. So I have a, uh, one that teaches the, the basics and foundations, uh, the skills of the ceremonial magician. But um, I also have ones that go into the Lamegatons Goetia, the Lamegatons Almadel, and then of course, uh, drawing spirits into crystals um, for people who want to learn how to do that uh, system as I've practiced it. So um, yep, quite a bit going on. So make sure listeners check out the podcast and video descriptions because you can uh, get Frater Ash and Chassan's email to sign up for those courses uh, and other links for uh, ways to contact Frater Chassan, someone who is incredibly busy, but ceremonial magician, author, uh, martial artist, practicing occultist, Frater Ash and Chassan. Thank you so, so much just for taking the time and sharing your wisdom on the podcast today, Frater Chassan. It is always uh, both an honor and a pleasure. So thank you so much. Always my pleasure to come on and speak with you. Thank you. Thank you.